uh, so you can, you can post. Uh, but it's my pleasure to introduce Sumit Sharma, who doesn't need any introductions, and he's going to be talking about update on geographic atrophy. Right, thank you. Financial disclosures are as listed, and the relevant one to this is I do serve as a consultant for Apellis. So we know geographic atrophy is an advanced form of dry AMD, and 30% of AMD patients will progress to develop GA. And when, they get, when patients develop GA, they develop these dense irreversible scotomas. And if we look at the incidence, the incidence of GA is actually higher than the incidence of neovascular AMD. It's about the same until age 69, and then after that, the GA incidence is actually higher than the neovascular disease. Mm. So when we look at the treatment strategies for dry AMD, there's a number of different approaches, but we don't have a lot of time. I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to cover what's uh, either recently been approved or will soon be approved, which is the pathway of suppressing inflammation. And so suppressing inflammation through complement modulation. We, there's a lot of things that we still don't understand about geographic atrophy and complement. We don't know what the source of complement activation is. We don't know the main pathway that's involved. We don't know if it's from lifelong complement activation or it's acute overreactivity. And we really don't know what the risks of inhibition are going to be. And we don't know how and where we should block complement. Do you need to do it locally? Or do you, do you, is it uh, systemic blockage necessary in order to get the most uh, benefit? <clears throat> so we'll look at the different uh, complement pathways. And so I remember being in medical school and learning about complement and being like, great, I'm going to ophthalmology. I never have to think about this again. And here we are, and all we think about now in terms of geographic atrophy is complement. But, but what you need to remember, despite all the different pathways, C3 and C5 are really part of the, the common pathway uh, after a complement gets activated in one of those uh, different manners. And so either C3 or C5 are also where one therapy has recently been approved, and that's uh, pegcetacoplan, which was approved in February of 2023, and then C5, where there's another therapy that's going before the FDA, and so we're going to focus on those two. So Derby and Oaks were two phase three studies of intravitreal pegcetacoplan in patients with geographic atrophy, where patients were randomized one to one to one to either monthly pegcetacoplan, every other month pegcetacoplan, or sham injections. Primary uh, endpoint was at 12 months with an 18-month analysis and a secondary endpoint readout at 24 months. And, and there's some key factors that you need to remember about this study. So this study, uh, uh, both Derby and Oaks allowed patients with subfoveal GA and with fellow ICNV. And this will become evident why this is relevant a little bit later as I go along. So the primary endpoint was met in Oaks, where you saw a 16% reduction in the every other month group and a 22% reduction in the monthly group compared to sham. And the, both of these were statistically significant. But in Derby, at 12 months, the primary endpoint was not met because the, uh, neither the every other month or the monthly reduction were statistically significant at 12 months. Uh, when you combine both of the studies and you look at lesion growth rate in uh, Oaks and Derby combined, you see that both of the uh, every other month and the monthly groups met primary endpoint, that, and that was statistically significant, but those p-values are all nominal. And then when you go out to 24 months, again, the p-values here are nominal, but you do meet the primary endpoint, and you see that the rate of change actually accelerates between months 18 and 24. So if you look at it by six-month uh, time windows, we see that there's actually further reduction in the growth rate as time goes on in both the every other month and monthly groups. However, at 24 months, there is not any statistically significant difference across the study arms on all, any of the key secondary visual acuity or visual function endpoints. So no difference in best corrected visual acuity, no difference in maximum reading speed, no difference in functional reading independence index, and on microperimetry, there, the mean threshold sensitivity was not statistically significant in Oaks. And then the other thing that we also have to look at is the safety side of things. And really, what are the rates of intraocular inflammation? And I think that you, we see that as the study goes along, we're seeing uh, at 12 months in the every month group, there was 2.1% of the patients had intraocular inflammation. And this could have been any type uh, at, in, compared to 1% in the every other month. But then out to 24 months, there was 3.8% versus 2.1% and none in the sham at 12 months, one patient in the 24 months. This includes four events that happened early on in the study that were linked to drug impurities that was resolved afterwards and didn't recur, but there were other events that happened after that. 
However, of note, there were no reports of occlusive or non-occlusive retinitis or vasculitis in any of these patients. The specific breakdown uh, in terms of what the inflammatory events were isn't clear here, but the endophthalmitis rate was about what you would expect with any of the, uh, any intravitreal injection, which is about one per 3,000 injections. The other thing that uh, happened is that these patients who were being treated had a higher rate of developing new onset of exudative AMD in the study eye at both uh, 20, 12 and 24 months. If you look at the sham group, it's about a 2 to 3 percent rate of developing neovascular AMD in the study eye. And if you look at every other month, it's 4 percent and at uh, 6 percent in the uh, every month group. And at 24 months, that doubles for the every month group. So the 12.2% of eyes developed exudative AMD versus 6.7% in the every other month. And this was also confirmed by the reading center at 24 months, but the rates were a little bit lower when confirmed by the reading center. The vast majority of the CNVs were occult lesions, and the patients who developed exudative AMD were allowed to continue treatment with the study drug and receive on-label anti-VEGF therapy per discretion of the investigators. And no one discontinued in the study arms because of developing exudative AMD. Well, how different is this if you look at the eyes that had fellow CNV at baseline versus not having, fellow, uh, eye, having CNV at baseline? There was a slightly different, slightly lower rate, but not that different. But what's, what is relevant is that 55% of the patients did have um, a, a fellow eye CNV. And this will become relevant when we talk about the other drug that's going before the FDA, which did not allow fellow eye CNV. But, so there is a slightly lower rate if you didn't have uh, CNV in your fellow eye. And then safety-wise, if we look at the treatment emergent adverse events in the study eye, there's a couple that pop that uh, are very relevant. The ischemic optic neuropathy, there was two patients in Oaks in the every month group and one patient in the every month group in Derby that were coded as serious adverse events in the study eye. We've already talked about the inflammation incidents. These are only the serious adverse events, but this is serious adverse events as coded by the investigator. If you look at the label, after the label came out, we actually see that the ischemic optic neuropathy rate was 1.7%, which would mean eight patients instead of the three that are reported as serious. So there's maybe a slightly higher rate of ischemic optic neuropathy than what was reported as, uh, or what was coded as serious. We don't really have any clarity on what the difference is between the non-serious coded events versus the serious coded events. So I think there's some more uh, information that we're gonna need for this, and we're gonna have to see how th that changes over time. So the other therapy is a vecnacaptad pegol, which has a PADUFA date in August uh, 19th of 2023. This is a C5 inhibitor. This was based on two studies, GATHER1 and GATHER2. GATHER1 randomized patients one to one to one in part one to either one milligram or two milligram versus sham monthly, or part two in a one to two to two randomization of two milligrams or four milligrams versus sham. And the primary endpoint was the change in the growth rate of the GA at 12 months versus GATHER2, which randomized patients to two milligrams monthly up to one year, and then re-randomized patients to continue with either monthly dosing or every other month dosing versus continuing with sham dosing. And in both GATHER1 and GATHER2, the pre-specified primary endpoint was met at 12 months and showing a reduction in the growth rate of the lesions. But there's some key differences, so you can't directly compare the change in growth rate because both GATHER1 and GATHER2 only allowed non-foveal center points. If, as long as there was one micron between the foveal center point and the GA lesion, you could get in, but if it crossed through the foveal center point, you weren't allowed in either of these studies, and they did not allow any eyes with fellow eyes CNV in the study. So we can't make a direct comparison because these are probably different patient populations, but it's relevant to, to, to just know that there are some differences between the two. And as we see here, as you get further away from the foveal center, there's a further reduction in the GA lesion growth over time. And this, the figure on the right shows that as you increase your minimum distance to the foveal center, the percent reduction in the, fo in the GA growth rate increases. So Similarly, we see that the, in terms of the uh, advanced uh, OCT biomarkers, there's a reduction in progression uh, to IRORA and CRORA. And then when we look at vision, and you can do this in this study because you didn't have any that had center point involvement, we're actually seeing a 59% risk reduction in the percentage of patients who are having a 15-letter vision loss. 
In terms of safety, we see that there's uh, pretty similar rates between the treated versus the untreated arms in both Gather 1 and Gather 2 in terms of overall safety events. We break that down further. We see that there is, though, a higher rate of choroidal neovascularization, just as we saw with Pexeticoplan. Slightly different rates, but again, no fellow ICNVs were allowed. And uh, uh, incidence of intraocular pressure increases that were higher, but most of these were transient at the time of the injection. However, there were no reported cases of ischemic optic neuropathy and only one case of intraocular inflammation in GATHER1, but in the extension of GATHER1 out to 18 months, there has been one case of ischemic optic neuropathy reported in the 2 milligram group. Looking at the CNV rate, we see it's 6.7 percent in the 2 milligram group in GATHER2 and 9 percent in the GATHER1 group. This is either exudative or what was coded as non-exudative uh, neovascularization if there was no clear fluid listed. But based on investigator coding, there was either 6.7% or 9% rate at 12 months. And so when we compare these, you can't do that direct comparison between the studies because Pexeticoplan studies allowed fellow ICNB in about 55% of patients, and 65% of the patients in the study in uh, Derby and Oaks had subfoveal disease, whereas with Avecna Captad, you didn't have any fellow ICNB and no foveal center point involvement. And we know that uh, from both the studies that there's greater reductions in growth rate as you get further from the foveal center point, and there's higher rates of CNB in patients who have fellow inv eye involvement. So as I've been saying, you can't directly compare them, but some of the safety data may eventually differentiate these, but we are going to need something like the CAT study to do a direct comparison between these if uh, the second drug does end up getting approved by the FDA in August. So uh, both slow down, but don't reverse vision loss from GA is the other key. And for the fellows in the room, you know, when you look at these GA lesions, you can't just tell based on the looking at them. They still progress. And I think that's a big key for talking to patients is that the, these do, but neither one of these drugs stop the GA. Neither one of them are going to reverse vision loss. They're going to slow down their vision loss in the future, though. And there's a number of other clinical trials for other treatment strategies that I didn't have time to discuss today. Thank you. Great, great presentation, a lot, of, a lot of data. Any questions from the audience or the panel? Can you tell me about the ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, the severity, visual acuity outcomes? What do we know anything yeah, about? I don't think we know enough about it yet. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting when you look at the Iveric study where you're actually showing a, just by going even a few microns away from the phobia, you have a more beneficial effect. Is there any sort of uh, hypothesis that you have as to why that may be occurring? So beneficial effect in terms of GA growth rate Growth itself. rate slowing. Yeah, and so yeah. It, I, I don't know for sure. I mean, if I was going to hypothesize, I would say that get it going through the foveal center, uh, as you get further away, there's got to be something that's protective of the GA lesion itself or, or that's preventing uh, further growth once it passes through the phobia. Because if you look at macular translocations, when you rotate the fovea away, they would get GA in the new area. So there's something from the fovea that's got to be a trophic factor or something else that's causing it. I don't know in detail. That's completely conjecture. But or the baseline. The, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, uh, aren't the baseline growth rates higher also for foveal involving GA? Yeah, no, they are. Yeah. So the, the, there's got to be just something inherent about the. Crossing the foveal. It could just be the patients are different, too, when they've already had foveal involvement. <clears throat> Next up, we have uh, Dr. Matthew Orr from Ohio State University. And um, Matt is going to talk about real-world experience with Fresmap. So thank you. Thank you to the committee. It's an honor and privilege to be here and uh, to get a chance to talk a little bit about Fresmap and some of the real-world experience that we have with this. So. Um, my disclosures, I was a primary investigator uh, for the Lucerne trial at our site. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little about uh, Vibismo, uh, Farisimab. And just as kind of a review, uh, many of us are familiar, familiar with this data, but Farisimab is a combined mechanism medication. It's a bispecific antibody, and it essentially binds two different uh, molecules, vascular endothelial growth factor A and angiopoietin 2. And we're very familiar with anti-VEGF. Um, inhibiting endothelial proliferation, reducing vascular permeability, and suppressing knee vascularization. Uh, Angiopoietin 2, uh, by blocking it, you're improving vascular stability and you're desensitized, the, the molecule desensitizes the, the, 
vessel to the actions of VEGFA. Um, so there were two major studies uh, for phase three that kind of were behind the FDA approval for this drug. Tanaya, which is a, a lake in Yosemite, come to learn, and then another lake, Lucerne, which is in Switzerland. Very similar. So the purpose of this study was to evaluate the safety and efficacy of ferisimab for the treatment of wet AMD. And in the design, uh, this is a randomized, double-masked, non-inferiority trial. And these patients were all treatment-naive uh, nevascular AMD patients. So they were essentially uh, randomized to two different arms. Uh, one arm received ferisimab 6 milligrams, and the other uh, received a flibercept 2 milligrams every eight weeks. Now, this is a busy slide, but essentially what it explains is in the uh, ferisimab arm, the, the patients were then kind of triaged into three different arms based on their disease activity. They either received ferisimab every eight weeks, 12 weeks, or 16 weeks based on the activity when they were monitored. So the primary endpoint for the study was the mean change in best corrective visual acuity. There are over 1,300 patients in the study. And in the Tanaya study, the change from baseline was essentially positive 5.8 letters for the frisimab arm and 5.1 for a flibber step. We're very similar. Uh, we're used to seeing this data presented this way, but this kind of gives you an idea of how patients did over time. And then Lucerne, very similar. Uh, frisimab 6.6 .6 letter improvement and the ILEA 6.6. So again, that data here. So this is really the, the take-home slide from the study showing the durability of frisimab and the essential um, uh, potential benefit for uh, vibismo as, as a therapy. Um, over 80% or up to 80% of the patients were able to go out at least 12 weeks with 44 to 45% of patients getting about 16 weeks of durability with this treatment. So this treatment seems to have a pretty solid durability, uh, especially compared to flibercept. The adverse events in these were very comparable. They're the kind of adverse events you'd expect in terms of intravitreal injections. Uh, and this was both for uh, Lucerne and Tanaya. The intraocular inflammation for these, were very low, 2% uh, and 1.2%, and these mostly resolved and were low grade. So in conclusion, the visual benefits with ferisimab given up to 16 week intervals demonstrate the potential to extend time between treatments for patients. So this is great. Um, this drug got FDA approved January 31st of 2020, uh, 2022, I'm sorry, and uh, is, uh, got approval for age-related AMD as well as diabetic macular edema. So that's a, a great clinical trial, but what does it look like in the real world? So I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about the real world here. Some of you may be familiar <laughs> with uh, the real world as an MTV show. You may not know that that's where Sunil got his start it did. Uh, it did. back in the day. Great time. It was awesome. That's actually how Dan Martin found him, I believe. <laughs> I believe. So we went ahead and I, I took a, a look at our data that we have at OSU. Uh, so in this, we looked at the results of essentially switching patients from various anti-VEGF agents to Vibismo in a real world setting. So on this, this retrospective review, we looked at all of the patients at OSU who were switched to treatment with uh, ferisimab at various clinics throughout OSU. And the patients had to have a diagnosis of neovascular AMD, and they had to have been previously treated with anti-VEGF drugs. So the primary outcome in this study was to look at the mean change and best corrective visual acuity from baseline to follow-up. We did want to, to follow up for any interocular inflammation, and we were looking at the mean change of CRT from baseline to follow-up. So um, with this, one of the real world experiences I think which is kind of interesting, and this is more um, sort of nuanced, but one of the things I found is when we, when Frisimab came out, there was actually a pretty long runway uh, at our institution to getting new therapies added. And I think that's been something I've noticed. I've been at OSU now for about 10 years. 10 years ago, it was a little bit easier to get things in there. 10 years makes me sound old, but man, that makes the people at this table feel a little bit older too, <laughs> especially Alex. I'm, I'm looking right at you, buddy. Um, wow, you're coming out throwing, <laughs> man. I love it. <laughs> but anyway, the, the other thing I, I would say from a practical perspective, if you're using the medication, it's a very thick, viscous medication. So I do find that when you're pushing that medication, at least the feel of it is a little different from some of the drugs we're used to using. Um, our baseline demographics were pretty comparable. The vast majority of the patients in here were, were white. The, the results of the study here uh, that we were able to show, the mean change in best corrective visual acuity, these are essentially pretty similar. This is a logmar. The, the graph uh, makes it look a little different, but this is essentially basically going from 20, 68, 20 over 68 to 20 over 67. So they're essentially the same visual acuity. Um, the, the, there was a little bit of a, a more noticeable change in the central retinal thickness uh, when you look at these patients. 
Um, and this is sort of a representative example of an OCT of a patient that was receiving, they were a short responder to ILEA, uh, and they had been receiving uh, therapy pretty much every four weeks. There's some baseline subretinal fluid, and then a month after receiving frisimab, uh, the central, the subretinal fluid went away, and the pigment field attachment uh, seemed to get a little bit smaller. Uh, there were no, fortunately, incidences of interocular inflammation in, the, in this cohort that we looked at. And I think that uh, some of the data that we took away from this, this is probably one of the more interesting slides, is what therapies were switched. So again, you're, you're talking about patients who are receiving treatment already, who were then switched to a new drug. Uh, and in the vast majority of the patients that were switched in this particular study, uh, most of these patients were receiving ILEA. Uh, we do have uh, at least one person who is using cimbrolocizumab in their clinic. Um, there is Lucentis and Avastin as well. So some of these patients were switched over. And then this is probably the take-home slide, and I would, uh, I would, I would say this, this slide has a lot of information, but I think there's some caveats that you want to take away from this. So the first thing to notice is that actually in most of these patients, the, the duration of therapy was only extendable out to about eight weeks or less. So the, um, the real-world experience with this was definitely different than the clinical trial. Uh, we did have one patient that was able to go out past 16 weeks, but again, it was interesting to see that the vast majority of patients uh, did not even get past the eight-week mark, and I'll talk a little about that in just a second. Um, so when I'm talking about this, one of the things I would want to point out is that obviously in a real-world experience, it's going to vary from clinical trials for a number of different reasons. And I, I caution with that slide two things. One, it's a limited data set, but most importantly, the ba you have to remember the baseline characteristics of the patients in this study were all patients who were previously receiving anti-VEGF. None of them are treating naive, so that obviously you can't really compare to the clinical trials. But in our practices, when you're taking care of patients, this is what most of us are looking at, right? You've got a patient, they're a short responder to ILEA, I want to try a new drug, what can I expect? Um, there certainly were patients that did get some extension to the durability, but there were also a lot of patients that did not. They got at least as much um, or about the same, uh, depending on the drug that you switched from. So again, I just want to caution that. I think it's important data to have, and it's just important to know when you're treating these patients, I wouldn't expect it to knock it out of the park when you first treat these patients. If you're getting about the same result or a couple weeks of additional extension, that would be a win in these patients who have already previously been treated. And then finally, um, the patients that were switched did maintain visual acuity. There was a, a little bit of a clinical noticeable uh, decrease in central retinal thickness, uh, and there were no instances of inter interocular inflammation, so it did appear safe. And that's what I have on the real world experience. Question, questions for Matt? So kudos to looking at uh, your, your guys' data. Um, I think uh, it's important to look at how it, 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 it gets uh, translated to the real world. Um, you know, one big reason that these numbers might not be similar to the data is that, the, from the clinical trial data, is that we're probably switching patients that are very resistant to treatment, um, unlike the study, which took, I think, naive patients. Mm -hmm. or, um, and then also, uh, they used loading doses, which I'm guessing, did, did you, do you usually use loading doses when you switch? Or? So that was one of the things I looked at in the study. Nobody did loading doses, yeah. right? So they, I mean, you could, you could argue that some of them did because they were getting treatment every four weeks, but that's what they were receiving before. But it wasn't, you know, we're going to load you every four weeks and then, and then do it. I, I love that study. You know, I think it's really helpful to look at your own data. There is also the Truckee study, which looks at something very similar to this at a, at a large scale and demonstrates very similar findings to what you've demonstrated, sort of relative stability in visual acuity and improvement in the anatomy. And as for durability, I think you kind of highlight an important point, but when you're extending, are you extending in the way in which the clinical trial was doing, where you're extending every four weeks? Because uh, you know, with considering that this drug has only been a, uh, approved for about a year, when you're looking at the 12 and 16 weeks, the question is, how many of them were rate limited just by time alone when you're looking at that durability component? Yeah, exactly. And that's a, a, a big part of this as well. The data set's small and the time is limited because it took a long runway for us to even get first map on the formulary. So it was a pretty decent amount of patients um, that were limited by time. But again, to your point, the treatment, again, this was not a prospective study, it was retrospective. There were different clinical practitioners doing different things in their clinic. Uh, and what I took away from that was most patients, were, most of the physicians were using treat and extend with the every two week extension. Nobody was going, okay, we're gonna take you out for eight and then continuing to go from there. Gotcha. Great. 
Uh, moving on, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Judy Kim from the Medical College of Wisconsin. And Judy is going to talk about home monitoring in AMD. Thank you for the invitation. I'm one of the adoptees of COLA Institute. And happy birthday, Alex. <laughs> Thank you. We will sing happy birthday. Uh-huh. <laughs> all right, we're, we're all family. We're Ratna, we're Ratna family. Let's do it, Judy. Come on, let's do it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, to you. Happy birthday dear Alex. Happy birthday to you. I won't blow on the mic. Social media moment. I, I hope it's your birthday, man, because that was a lot of effort. Yeah, I go to restaurants. Sometimes I'm, it's my birthday. Just did you do that as your? Were you worked at waitstaff when you were in high school? Right. You, that? you did it. You were that person. I got it. All right, let's talk about home monitoring of neovascular AMD using home OCT. Uh, I do serve as a consultant for Notal Vision, and I will discuss an investigational device that's not yet FDA approved. So you are all look good at looking at OCT, looking for the fluid. How about if you could get an OCT that tells you whether the fluid is in the retina or under the retina, whether it's centered at the fovea or extrafoveal, and the volume to the nanoliter level. Okay? We get OCT, and that's how we do our treatments, OCT guided. However, the uh, OCT is done at the doctor's office, so we get limited information. If we could do home OCT, we could get more information and with the use of artificial intelligence, we could get daily home OCT information that gives us fluid volume trajectory, graph like this. So here's a patient who's getting injection in both eyes, six weeks apart, comes in and gets an injection, but before that, the patient gets an OCT, and you see that right eye has more sub uh, retinal fluid than the left eye, so green line always will be subretinal fluid, and the purple line will be always intraretinal fluid. But what happens in the black box? <laughs> Can you see the black box? Can you look into the black box? Well, this is what happens. The right eye has been sitting in a lot of fluid all this time, and uh, if we had known that, we may be uh, able to personalize treatment, not from person to person, but even eye to eye. How about that? Think about that. In order to do this, we need digital health model, where a retina specialist refers the patient to the monitoring center for home OCT, and the monitoring center helps to set it up at the patient's home, and the uh, OCT uh, is done centered on the uh, macula, three millimeter, three millimeter, dense 88 scans are B scans are taken, and because there are a lot of B scans that need to be uploaded and analyzed, that's where we need artificial intelligence. And then the retina specialist can um, always look online to look at the images, fluid thickness maps, fluid volume trajectories, and you could even set the threshold to get alert notification. So patient acquires daily OCT scans, artificial intelligence detects the fluid, and provides fluid the next map, and we can get this trajectory curves uh, separated by intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid, and the volume over time. In order to be able to do this, however, you need three things. One, we need to demonstrate the patient can self-image. Two, that the AI algorithm that we are using is accurate and reliable. And that it makes clinical difference. After seeing all this trajectory and so forth, what does it mean? Does it matter? So let's talk about each one of these. There was a home OCT self-imaging study um, enrolling 290 uh, subjects with neovascular AMD in at least one eye. So a total of 531 eyes, 310 of which had neovascular AMD. 
There was a two minute video tutorial done at the office without any assistance from the technician and then the subject self-imaged using the home OCT at the office followed by technician, the photographer taking the uh, um, image of the patient using one of the commercial OCT, Cirrus or Spectralis. And then the uh, ophthalmologist compared home OCT images as uh, uh, well as in-office OCT. Well, 91% of subjects were able to successfully image their eyes, and comparison between the home OCT image and the in-office OCT, there was a high um, correlation between the presence and absence of subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid. It was dependent on patient's visual acuity, however. Um, there was a significant success rate up to visual acuity of 20 over 320. Lower visual acuity did not do as well. However, patients said 96% of them agreed or strongly agreed that it was simple and it was easy to use. So next, artificial intelligence-based fluid quantification. Artificial intelligence-based NOTAL OCT analyzer or NOAA algorithm segments fluid, subretinal fluid from uh, intraretinal fluid and quantifies a total volume and uh, it was compared in 118 images, uh, the ones that had fluid. And uh, the bland almond analysis uh, graph you see here shows that the mean difference was only 2.7 nanoliters and uh, it, most of it was in between this uh, limits of agreement. Also there was um, Pearson correlation of 91.6%. So it was quite um, uh, reliable. Finally, the longitudinal study at patients' homes. How do they do when this is now placed in patients' homes. There was a study with 29 eyes of 15 subjects uh, from two centers in patients with neovascular AMD. Mean video, visual acuity was 2040, ranging between 2020 to 20 over 200. This was a short-term study of uh, three months, 90 days. And the system was delivered and uh, support management was with the digital uh, um, imaging monitoring center. And there was an in, at home video training and no uh, assistance was provided by the uh, clinic at all. So how did they do? Well, over 2,374 images were obtained and 96% of the patients, when they attempted to get a scan, they were able to complete. There was a correlation of 0.92 between in-office OCT and the, uh, what the NOAA volume scan showed. Also, uh, patients found it easy to use, so about 5.7 uses per week. 40 seconds per eye, and it got better over time, so some learning curve there. And the manufacturer quality in, in, uh, signal index, if it's higher than two, it's considered a good quality image of OCT, and it was 4.4 um, median. So, very good, right? We met one, two, and three. Let's see some cases. This is a patient managed with home OCT, uh, started on December 22nd, and then you start seeing the intraretinal fluid starting to rise uh, and uh, received an injection in January. And you see that the fluid goes down really quickly and then maintains without fluid, and then uh, when it goes up again, one gets a second injection. So potentially, you could monitor the patient and the patient does not have to come in until there's a fluid um, increase. Think about that. How is it going to work uh, and affect our workflow in our offices? As we go on to longer durability drugs, such as gene therapy, port delivery system, and others that are coming in the market, we may need this more than ever. This patient got um, port delivery system in April of 22, so he should have come in for a six months refill in October, but he decided that he did not want to get a refill. So the home OCT comes into play. What happens if he did not come in for that six months refill? Well, he stayed dry for several months, but then in March, 
11 months later, almost a year later, the fluid starts to go up and then gets a refill injection and the fluid goes down. So this is a way to monitor our patients with long-term delivery uh, systems and uh, we're gonna get more and more information. How about this patient? Do everybody have this beautiful curve up and down? Well, when we talk about fluid accumulation, we're talking about really little amount of fluid. The, look at the OCT down there, that very little fluid. But then we did nothing, and the fluid goes away. Well, interestingly, this patient has these fluctuations of up and down, up and down, up and down, with the, nothing being done. And so if we had seen the patient over here in the clinic, we would say, oh, we should inject. But if we had seen the patient down here, we might have said, oh, we're not gonna inject. Why do patients have these up and down fluctuations? We don't know, but we know that fluctuation in uh, these fluids may end up with poor uh, prognosis. Well, the patient gets the injection and there's a, a very rapid response. So it gives us some ways to control and how much fluid we can tolerate. So in conclusion, home-based OCT management um, allows us to quantify fluid and locate the fluid, because that's how we currently treat our patients with the neovascular AMD, right? And having these monitoring centers allow us to be able to do this in a safe and efficient manner. And we saw that patients were able to self-image their eyes at home, and automatic fluid quantification is possible with a reliable um, algorithm. And there was a compliant and reliable testing that can be done at patient's home. And the monitoring center um, helps us uh, to be able to do that safely. So imagine how your practice may change when this comes um, alive. Thank you. So, Any questions or comments? So Judy, it's really cool, uh, and it's intuitively obvious how we'd use it. The question I have is, is what does the FDA require? So in other words, you know, here you're, you're showing us a certain level, and at some point, theoretically, uh, uh, an alert needs to be sent to us that the patient needs to come in. And, and so it, sort of what is the requirement the FDA is going to tell you to not have false positives, false negatives, et cetera? So what FDA requires right now is that uh, the home OCT is as good as the uh, commercial OCT in terms of getting images, uh, good quality images, and that the AI algorithm is as good as you, Peter Kaiser, in being able to pick out fluid. Oh, so it's ready to go now. Though. Yes, <laughs> exactly. It's ready to go yesterday. <laughs> Got to be better than me. Dr. Kim, thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Um, would the AI algorithm notify uh, just the physician or also the patient? Because one thing you mentioned about workflow, one potential fear I have is that this is going to result in like 200 calls to the office every day uh, with patients saying, you know, doc, it looks a little bit different now or, uh, it, you know, you just injected me and it doesn't look different enough. Um, how, how do you foresee that being managed? Well, the company probably will wish that there will be 200 calls that you are using that many. <laughs> that referred that many patients to use this machine. <laughs> um, the patients, from what I understand, will not be um, 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 notified. It will be you, the office, will be notified. And you set the threshold. So there will be some learning curve as to how much fluid uh, can be tolerated per patient, per eye, and you may set it at different levels um, from visit to visit after seeing the patient. You say, well, maybe I set it too low. I'll, I'll go a little bit higher next, for the next time. So you do need to review, and um, you have all these images, um, actual OCT images, B scans, as well as these trajectory graphs and the map, so you can um, look at those even before um, having the patient come in. Yes, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, you know, I, I just think this is so cool, right? I, but I, I do think we also have to kind of retrain how we think about these problems, right? Because a lot of times we have patients where they're, we're doing a classical treat and extend and their vision is stable long term and they probably have these fluctuations. And yet, on the other hand, you have these clinical studies that are not like quantitated to the nanoliter 
that are saying that fluid fluctuations is bad. So I think we probably need to go back to our traditional OCT data and say, well, what are those fluid fluctuations at a volumetric level that are ultimately going to have some sort of negative impact? I totally agree with you. I mean, we're, we're now living in a two-dimensional world of uh, microns. We have to now think about three-dimensional world of volume and also location. Um, so we, we may need to uh, learn as we use this uh, and this, um, learn how to set the threshold and how the patients do. Thank you, Judy. Wonderful talk. Um, so next up, next up, we have another adoptee, I guess, <laughs> uh, Dr. Amira Damalpali from University of Wisconsin Medicine, and she's going to talk about new concept in ultra-wide field imaging and OCT. Thank you. Thanks for the wonderful invitation and, and great talk so far. Uh, and we'll directly jump into some images coming from the Wisconsin Reading Center. So there's two portions. One is OCTs themselves, and since we are in the dry AMD session, I'll be focusing on dry AMD, both non-exudative and exudative, and um, ultra-wide field, a couple of updates there. So starting with non-exudative, we all know from decades of data that there's drusen, they develop pigmentary changes, and then there's a risk of geographic atrophy, and the ARIDS simplified severity scale that we use regularly using our one hand is, uh, is well known to predict progression. The same concept has been taken into OCT, and a lot of biomarkers have been looked at for progression to GA um, over the years, many, many things, and these four have kind of Come, come as the top contenders and the most popular ones that pre pre potentially predict the risk of progression. Uh, the first is a hyperreflective foci, which are supposed to be, or assumed to be, these pigment clumps that detach from the RPE and come into the retina. The second is hyporeflective drusen, which are these drusen before they collapse, probably. So something like, like uh, not the back. Oops. Sorry, I pressed the wrong thing instead of the laser. <laughs> okay, there we go. So those um, empty caps with, within the drusen. And then we have spec uh, the reticular pseudodrusen, which is again a known risk factor for development of GA. And from the last few years, we know these reticular pseudodrusen are in a different plane. Drusen are RPE elevations, whereas reticular pseudodrusen is the one you see on the left, has that RPE right nicely intact and sits on top of the RPE. And a larger drusen volume is also a risk factor. We do not have enough, we do not, do not, do not have any longitudinal prospective study that looks like, you know, at the progression of uh, ice with this, these risk markers and development of GA, but we do have enough of retrospective data, fellow eyes of neovascular studies, to show that these seem to be important. But these are the, the ones, those four risk factors are kind of the intermediate AMD. But then what happens that stage where th those probably take three to four years to progress to GA, but we want to get that stage like six months, one year before GA starts. And that's where nascent GA comes in place. And this, was, this has been around for about a decade now, surprisingly, and it kind of talks about two things that happen uh, to develop nascent GA. One is where you have the subsidence of the layers, so you can see that dip in the layers of the outer plexiform, and then you have these hyporeflective bands that develop. Both go simultaneously, like together, but you usually see one better than the other, so it's an and-or criteria. So you can either see the dip or the wedge. And these constitute the nascent GA. And here, everything is happening in the photoreceptor region. We're not talking of RPE yet. Then we move on to the CAM criteria, the consensus of atrophy meetings group. And I, I'm actually going to go through a little bit on dig into this IRORA and CIRORA, because these are becoming enrollment criteria for clinical trials. We are having intermediate AMD trials start off. And retina specialists are now being asked to enroll patients with intermediate AMD, with IRORA, without IRORA, all kinds of combinations. And many times I hear, yes, I know all those RORA things, but do you really? Because they are complicated. And what 
CAM criteria does is it takes all three layers into consideration, the choroid, the RPE, and the photoreceptors, all three. And in the photoreceptor layer, it says all these features are in required. And there will be a post-test, right, where everybody will be asked to list these features. <laughs> um, so just, just to uh, summarize how these look, hypertransmission is pretty easy as you're enrolling patients into these trials. That's an easy one. RPE is also relatively easy. You're just looking. There could be absence. There could be disruption. You don't need true absence. And then in the photoreceptor region, you're looking at those same things, the subsidence, the wedge, the lack of ELM. So if you have those three things, you've got IRORA. And then it's a matter of size, which is a little tricky, but 250 micron is the cutoff under which it's IRORA, over which it's CRORA. So here's another example of CRORA patient with large, uh, with a nice 250 micron uh, separation there and the dip and the layer loss and photoreceptor loss. And, uh, yeah. and if it's too much to go through each B scan and identify, which it is, it is a lot of work to go through each of these B scans and identify each of these <laughs> lesions. And there are AI algorithms coming out that can detect these and make your life easier. But a good, easy way is to pull up the on-force image, and if the on-force image has hypertransmission defects, which are those red arrows, just uh, areas of hypertransmission, look at those spots, and that's where you could have your IRORA or CRORA. Not necessarily, but it's most probably those areas. So it helps you reduce the time required to scan through all these volume scans. So we have novel OCT biomarkers, the CAM criteria being refined, they're going to be uh, adjusted some more. And we do need prospective longitudinal study to validate these risk markers. There was one AMD Ryan initiative study in the US that got stopped because of lack of enrollment. And uh, we have MacuStar going on in EU, which is going to tell us a lot more about these biomarkers and what they mean. So talking about wet AMD, Judy has covered most of it, and I knew she would be here, so I, I really cut this down to the bare minimum. Um, and our experience with the, uh, home OC, with the NOAA uh, AI analyzer is we had the opportunity to look at it with the ARIDS2 study with about 1,000 patients, and it was reading center versus AI and the retina specialist versus reading center. So, and with that comparison, the AI and the reading center agreed perfectly, but we didn't really agree with the retina specialists. <laughs> <laughs> and why was that? That was because of that threshold that Judy was talking about, which is the low fluid volume, uh, clinically not so significant fluid. So adjusting the threshold takes care of all that. And uh, uh, that, that's kind of where most of the disagreements were. Now, apart from uh, Notal uh, Vision's AI analyzer, there's also another company, Retinsight, which can also produce these fluid maps and longitudinal analysis. Both, of course, are not yet FDA approved, but can give uh, fluid metrics. So uh, the DRCR network is going to do a protocol AO, which is home OCT guided treatment versus treat and extend. So putting this into play and seeing how does uh, uh, home monitoring work in the real world kind of thing. So this will be an interesting study. The protocol is under uh, preparation. So that's the uh, summary of the wet AMD management as we get these long-acting drugs. Now finally, ultrawide field imaging. There is, apart from optos, of course, there's the Claris, OCT, uh, Claris uh, ultrawide field imaging also available now, beautiful pictures. We haven't uh, much experience in AMD. We do use it for diabetic retinopathy, but not so much for AMD. The um, OPERA study, or the OPTOS peripheral uh, retinal uh, study, looked at all these OPTOS images in patients with AMD. And what we had was, again, 1,000 uh, eyes were evaluated. A lot of them had drusen in the mid-periphery, which we all know. Many people have drusen in the mid-periphery. No, nearly 97% of those with AMD had drusen, and some had CNV, GA. So this is a patient, this is stereo imaged and put together, and you can see there is, uh, there's drusen out there, lots of it. So uh, many patients have drusen in uh, AMD. 
Some have that GA sticking out to the side. Some have CNV out to the side. So there was interesting findings that we found. Pseudodrusen are impressive on these ultrawide field images because they go so far out into the periphery. Autofluorescence, not as much. You don't pick it up with the optos. The OPERA study also had a five-year follow-up. So year five of ARIDS-2 and year 10 of ARIDS-2, there were op uh, OPTOS images. These are under evaluation now. But what we're finding is that a lot of patients, apart from the macula, also develop changes outside in the um, extramacular region. So you can see all these changes happening outside. So AMD doesn't seem to be, it seems to be a panretinal disease, not just on the macula. And uh, we are still looking at quantifying these lesions and seeing if it has any risk markers and uh, can predict anything further. Thank you. Excellent, excellent talk and images. Any questions for me then? Alex? How frequently do you see those peripheral changes, do you think? Um, so if it's just drusen, yes, everybody. But if it is um, pseudodrusen, you see it, you know, if it's just the macula, if you're picking up about 7% of the time, it doubles if with optos. You see much more pseudodrusen with optos. And uh, GA, CNV are not as common, but, you know, about 5 to 10%. Has anyone looked at whether peripheral lesions correlate with macular progression of GA? Do you, that that's that's the uh, analysis that's underway, that's, the five-year okay. progression yeah. rates, yes. <clears throat> what what are your thoughts? A, oh, sorry. Oh, no, please go ahead. I, I think there was just a study in ophthalmology retina like two, two or three months ago that, that looked at a cohort of patients that had peripheral lesions and didn't show any progression of atrophy correlating with the macula. Yeah, I think the quantification. So in the original ARIDS, when we did just presence absence of drusen, there didn't seem to be a relationship, but we know drusen area is important more than just presence. So what we're looking at is the area right now. I was wondering when it comes to geographic atrophy and you look at images, you mentioned using unfast imaging as kind of the spots to look at to find GA. Do you find uh, unfast images useful in any other way? Um, in any other way, of, uh, for non-GA kind of lesions? No, for the GA, you know, in terms of monitoring progression and things like that, using unfast images. Unfast images are pretty good. They are a nice, especially if you get that slab analysis, they're pretty good to get a good impression of GA. And even uh, the Heidelberg imaging cannot produce those unfast, so that's the uh, con of it. But otherwise, unfast images should be equivalent to anything, yeah. Yeah, I think it's one of the problems with, in general with retina. We have so many modalities, imaging modalities, and they don't quite yeah. show the same thing. I have a All question right. for you. So great presentation. And so in my clinical practice, we have 13 offices, and every single office has OCTA. And so now that we're starting to treat patients with dry AMD, and we're watching more for that conversion from dry to wet, those are very difficult patients for me to interpret on OCTA. Is there better segmentation software on the way that's going to make it a little bit easier for us in clinical practice to get to these patients quickly? <laughs> <laughs> that's a loaded question. I know, that is a loaded yeah. question. Um, con conversion of the, in patients with GA is very difficult. Even at the reading center, we have, it gets passed around from one to the other, and four or five people will sit together, ponder at 20 minutes. That's, and my, that's my clinic too, yes. <laughs> yes, has it converted or not? Yeah. Because you see it in one, you don't see it. Is it real, is it not? It's, it is very difficult. So sorry, I don't have a good, good answer for that. Sure. I actually find OCT to be better than OCTA in picking up the conversion, the early conversion, that little grayish uh, area. Excellent, all right. Wonderful, thank you so much. And we're gonna move on to a panel discussion that's gonna be led by Peter Kaiser. All right, so the goal here is to kind of summarize everything we just did in, in 15 minutes. We'll see if we can do this. And I really want you to be as honest as you can with your answers, panelists, because that'll make it much more fun for the audience. Those are my <laughs> disclosures. So this is a patient who shows up in your clinic, Dr. Orr at Ohio State. The Ohio State. What, the Ohio State. <laughs> How do you follow them? Do you image this patient? What do you tell the patient? 
Yeah, so 68-year-old man with drusen, drusenoid PED. Um, yeah, we're going to do imaging. Um, I probably wouldn't, in full disclosure, do fluorescein at this point, but I would do OCTA. Uh, I would get fundus autofluorescence, and I would follow this patient um, very closely. So six months, one year, three months? If, if someone's presenting like this, especially if they're symptomatic, I might do three months. Um, okay, and not... Same question. What do you what do you do with this patient? So I would agree. I would not get an angiogram in this. I mean, depending on what, of course, the OCT looks like. But I would get an OCT and an autofluorescence. Um, and uh, depending on what that looks like, and uh, again, if they're symptomatic, I would probably do anywhere between uh, three to four months. Yeah. So you, this type of patient, I usually get an OCT first, just to see what's going on. If if I don't see anything that kind of scares me for CNV. Um, and the patient, you know, I, I fail to say the patient's seeing fine, not symptomatic, just coming in for their routine exam, assuming the OCT is fine. Uh, this was discussed already with Amitha, but I think it's really important to kind of understand some of the risk features you should be looking for on the OCT that may maybe bring back that patient a little earlier uh, versus the patient that you can say, maybe I'll see you in a year. Now, this patient has a lot of large drusen and pigmentary changes. You probably don't want to go to a year, but a lot of these early, well, this one's intermediate, but if it was an early AMD patient, maybe we can go uh, a little longer. And this just, uh, again, showing you that, that these features, the hyperreflective foci, the subretinal drusenoid deposits, drusen volume, et cetera, actually correlate very well with progression to GA. So if you see those features on your OCT, start thinking, maybe I need to bring that patient back uh, a little sooner. All right, let's bring back a patient now, submit, with GA, of these imaging modalities here, when the patient comes in, how do you image a patient with GA right now with a FDA-approved drug um, that we have? So I definitely get OCT, and if I have it, I'll get fundus autofluorescence. So the offices I'm at, I have fundus autofluorescence, but I actually find that OCT works a little better, and that Onfos lab gives you a really good view of the area of atrophy. I mean, the, when, it, when you talk about fundus autofluorescence, do you guys recommend green versus blue? What about near-infrared reflectance? You know, from a reading center standpoint, which one is the easiest to kind of follow fundus auto, follow patients on fundus autofluorescence? The blue is definitely the best, most beautiful pictures, um, although all three generally give the same in terms of measurements. But what is going to be complicated is that in clinical trials, we have this region finder software where you draw bridges and draw circles and do all kinds of things, spend 20 minutes on, on an eye, but how are you going to do that in your clinic? How are you going to measure? And I think that's a really good point. So when you're, when you're talking about a reading center, we're going to be following patients on this fundus autofluorescence, and they're going to want to know, just like my wet AMD patients, am I getting better, doc? So... You know, what things can we hope to have in the future that allow us to show a patient, hey, by the way, this is where you were a year ago, this is where you are in the, now, so you should continue these monthly or every other month injections. Is there anything coming that we can be hoping for? Uh, I think at Arvo, there's like a lot of sessions on AI-based um, measurements, automated measurements of GA, and those are turning out to be pretty good. So Nate, you said, you know, in your 100 patient day, <laughs> you know, walks in with geographic atrophy. We won't talk about yet if you treat them or not. What do you image with them? And then how are you going to finish, how are you going to image them thereafter at their the other visits? I've really found the near infra infrared really nice. We use, you know, almost always spectralis. And so it's got such good historical data because every single patient gets an OCT. And so we just have those beautiful images to look back over time. And once they have G8 that's demonstrated, and I want to show the patient or the family, the, the true fundus autofluorescence is just such a beautiful marker to show patients and family because it's such an e easy concept to get. Should we be doing wide field fundus autofluorescence or just we'll call it standard? Fundus autofluorescence? I just happen to have optos, so I use wide field. Wide field? Okay. Yeah. So these are the risk factors that we talked about. There's some on fundus autofluorescence OCT. I personally get, uh, if I'm starting a patient on peg set of Copeland, which we don't have yet at Cleveland Clinic, but I'm sending them to Retina Associates of Cleveland. Um, I'm on salary, so <laughs> <laughs> all good. They're getting treated. Um, 
I personally have been getting fundusol fluorescence on these patients because I never was before, right? But now I'm thinking if I'm going to be sending these patients for treatment, I actually want to follow it over time. So I'm getting fundusol fluorescence at least at baseline, and then OCT I'm going to follow every time I would see the patient uh, thereafter. You know, it's interesting because uh, fundusol fluorescence is not an easy test for patients. Oh no, it hurts. Yeah, so you know, it's uh, to your point. How often do you even get it, right? Well, well how often are you going to get it? I think maybe six months or a year, because you're probably not going to see much of a change, right? And, uh, and those patients, the question is how often do you get the OCTs to um, comes into play. I think the OCTs we're probably get, going to get mostly to look for conversion, and uh, I don't think you would need frequent autofluorescence. And this autofluorescence also, uh, not only is it very difficult for the patients, but there's also bleaching effect. Um, so from visit to visit, it may be also a little bit different, too. Um, near infrared actually is not bad, and we all get it, and we, we all have um, uh, OCT, and I always look at the uh, near infrared as well, and it's easy enough to show to patients if you, if you just wanted to educate. Um, if it's not for research, I think it might be enough. And looking at uh, um, subretinal um, adrenaline deposits also, you can do better with the near infrared. And uh, those patients do differently their atrophy. Sometimes can be um, uh, more aggressive. So I think you know, looking for those as uh, well would be nice. Yeah, and when you, if you look at it from a standpoint of studies, the fundus autofluorescence size correlates with the OCT size correlates with the near infrared reflectance size. So it's pretty much stick to one thing when you're following a patient, but all of them work, essentially. I'm still rather confused about how we're going to show patients whether these drugs are working or not. Because if you think about it, um, you know, on an individual basis, you're not going to show them that all of a sudden their GA has stopped. It's going to be slowing down. And that's very hard to quantitate. And it's going to be different throughout the lifespan of GA progression. So I think until we figure out a way to actually map their prior progression and pr be able to predict what the future progression is going to be, I don't, I don't actually know how important this might be. Maybe I'm wrong, but <laughs> I, I, I just think it's going to be difficult. I think it will be difficult. I think that's where it comes in uh, picking a patient that has a correct understanding of, of you know, what the goals is of your treatment. The family has to really know what they're going to be looking for or not looking for. Um, and that's for the short term. And then in the long term, I think it's, you know, hopefully these AI predictive algorithms that uh, Dr. Domopali mentioned um, hopefully will help as well. I agree with you. I mean, wh whether we need to uh, do these imaging or not, <laughs> you know, because we have to continue to treat, right? Uh, there was no treat and extend uh, or uh, stop and see. Um, they, they got injection every month or every other month. Um, so far, you know, it's, it's thought to be need to continue. So does it matter uh, um, for the patient, uh, for them to see whether they're uh, getting less worse? But we don't know what the comparator is. We don't have the uh, uh, sham eye to say, you know, you are less worse than if you had not gotten the injection. We, we don't have anything way to say that. But, but we know that, but the patients don't. They yeah, want patients don't know that. Working, right. but how, how are you going to tell me it's working? That, that's gonna yeah. be uh, how many yeah, people we're... on a panel have Peg said a Copeland or, or given it? I figured it would only be one. All right, <laughs> Nate, I assume you've been treating patients. What, at what interval are you treating the patients? You know, because you're gonna have to stick to the same interval is my assumption. What, what are you taught? What's your kind of discussion with your patient? It's a really good question. It's a question that comes up every single patient is how quickly do we have to come in? So the, the pegcetacopin label is Q25 to 60 days, so one to two month dosing. So you have good flexibility. And so, so far I've been doing Q6 week injections, splitting the difference. And the reason why that's more tolerable for the patient, for their family members, and also if you look at the safety profile, it was a little bit more well tolerated at the two month mark versus the one month injections. So six weeks seems to kind of to hit every mark for me. Now, given that there is this uh, uh, conversion to a wet AMD, yeah. do you do OCT at every visit, or how often do you do OCT? It's a really good question. So if you look at the rate of conversion, it was dose-dependent. So those patients who got more doses had a higher rate of conversion, both at one and two years. And so I do do an OCT every single time, and I actually think I, I pay more attention to the OCT now with my dry AMD patients than I did my wet AMD patients, because I'm really looking closely. That's why I was hoping there's more segmentation software coming soon. <laughs> Help me out. 
<laughs> yeah, it would be true. So yeah. let, let me go back to the panel. We'll assume that all of you actually have it to answer this question. So Yasha, this patient comes in unilateral. The other eye has obviously AMD, non-foveal GA. You can see it's non-foveal on the, on the OCT. Is this a good patient? 2020 vision. Mm -hmm. What you know, would you do with this patient? To, to Nate's point, I think we're all developing libraries of uh, near-infrared images, whether we know it or not. And so I think it really depends on the change over time. So I think a lot of times, this is somebody who's probably, we have five, maybe 10 years of data going back forever, how long we're in practice. And you can look at the near-infrared image and see how it changes. And here's a great example, by the way, of why I like near-infrared more than fundus autofluorescence. Because if you look at the fovea, the fovea is intrinsically dark on fundus autofluorescence. And so as the GA gets close to the fovea, it's really hard to know if it's foveal involving or non-foveal involving by the autofluorescence, but it becomes abundantly obvious by the near infrared. You didn't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> are you, are you going to treat this patient? Not treat this patient? What are you doing with this patient? I, if there is considerable rate of change, I'm going to start treating this patient. How old are they? So this patient's 70. This is a patient with, this is AMD. It's not something else. What's in the other eye? Oh, I meant more if they're like 98, I'm probably not treating them. But 70, I'm having a serious discussion with them about. All right, so you're basing it, it on age. And that, is that because it took a little while for Pixetic Copeland to kind of kick in? Or, or is it? No, more uh, it, it, the rate of progression, right? So if they're 98 and they're like this, their other eye isn't involved, the serious discussion is if they haven't grown a ton over the last two years, their life expectancy probably isn't to the point where it's going to become foveal involving. But that's ageism, right? It is. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where you have to have a discussion with them. I, I think, yeah, I think yeah. you need to talk with the patient instead yeah, of making absolutely. the decision for the patient. We'll have HR talk with you. <laughs> <laughs> Anant, here's another patient, non-foveal, although it looks kind of sub-foveal on that. It does. <laughs> so very close to foveal, but a much smaller lesion. You going to use pig set of copeland on this patient? What's the visual acuity? This patient is a little, little has a little bit, about 20, 30, a little bit of compromise, talks about trouble driving at night, having a little issues. There's a little heart. I, there's like a little heart. <laughs> um, I would offer it. I would, I would uh, discuss, you know, uh, you know with, with this, Treatment, I think, as, as mentioned earlier, you have to have a serious conversation about you know, the risk benefits and alternatives of the procedure, how often it has to uh, be administered, um, as well as uh, the fact that it's unlike wet AMD where you have poor vision, you're gonna get treated, and then they're gonna notice uh, a difference and you're gonna uh, protect them from serious vision loss. Um, in, in the very near term, uh, this is not the same thing. And if they understand that and they wish to proceed, then I would, I would do it. And I've actually found that there's been surprising buy-in uh, from a lot of patients. Um, you know, it's not, it was not available in Minnesota, uh, but it's anticipated to be available uh, within probably three or four months. And so I've accumulated quite a few, you know, a pretty long list of patients for... Too bad they won't be treated by you. Because <laughs> you're coming to join. <laughs> uh, so Nate, this patient, you know, we'll call it like just juxtafovial. Do you still use your Goldilocks six-week dosing, or would you put this patient on four-week? Because really here, it's all about efficacy. It's a really good question. So Pellis looked at you know whether subfoveal or extrafoveal lesions benefit more. And extrafoveal lesions actually benefit a little bit more than subfoveal lesions. Um, but to your point, I would be really aggressive with this lesion. I would probably do Q-month if the patient could tolerate it. Yasha, does it matter what the fellow eye has for any of these decisions? Like if, if I showed you those other two scans and the fellow eye looked like this, does that change your thinking in any way? I mean, in the clinic, yes. For a clinical trial, no. But okay. I, I think at this point, you know, this is a function of, of hope. And, we, you know, we've, we've heard the contrarian statements to uh, complement inhibition. Uh, but I think in this situation, it's inevitable this person's gonna lose fixation, right? We know that in treatment, they're still gonna progress. Uh, and so I think it's a very, that this is exactly as Dr. Kim said, this is a conversation with the patient and I'll leave it entirely in their hands. Danny, this will end with this one. This is the fellow I instead. Does this change your decision to treat or not? And now obviously this patient needs anti-VEGF in this eye. So how are you bringing this patient back for follow-up? Is this a new conversion in the fellow eye? Or they uh, well, in true? this picture, it looks like it is, but I just made this case up for you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. 
so this guy would continue anti-VEGF um, right now until uh, like kind of the billing stuff gets sorted. I'm not going to really be doing both eyes. I mean, sorry, the same eye with both injections. And then in terms of the fellow eye, um, depending if reimbursement's allowed, I will talk to them about the progression of GA. The other eye was the 2030 one hanging by a thread. Yep. Yeah, so that one I would uh, talk about starting a complement inhibitor. Um, and oops, I would uh, probably go to every two month on that one to start. And then uh, we'll see what interval they are with this eye. Um, and again, we'll have to see how reimbursement plays out, if whether they can be both done on the same day or not. So the every two month because you're worried about CNV conversion. Yep. Okay. Good. Well, you know, as you can see, we're going to have a lot of discussions in the upcoming 6, 12 months about, you know, how to treat patients. Hopefully this sort of opened some of those doors about some of the issues that surround the use of this drug. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started um, with our section two. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, our good friend, Nathan Steinle. Uh, to come on up and talk to us about the update on, on retinal vein occlusion treatments. Uh, Nate Steinle is over at California Retina Consultants. Thanks for coming, Nate. You're up. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Sunil, for uh, having me. And so I trained at the Cleveland Clinic 12 years ago now, 12 years ago. So time goes by fast. And I've been waiting for this invitation for 12 years, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's taking you that long to I, I deserve it. I to the bottom of the barrel yeah. here, so yeah. And uh, when they, they emailed me, I said, do you want two or three talks? I said, oh, no, just one. <laughs> you know, an hour or two? Just 10 minutes. All right, so I'll do 10 minutes here of RVO. I'm in California. We have a huge practice covering uh, northern LA up the coast. Um, we also got bought by uh, private equity three years ago, so I have some kind of um, knowledge from that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So talking about RVOs. Here's my disclosures. The Cleveland guys taught me that if you get pulled a lot of different directions, you're actually pretty unbiased. And so I've, I've had some really um, great interactions <laughs> overall with pharma. And uh, I see a lot of friendly faces here, and I'm, I'm lucky to have you all as friends. We know this stuff, but RVO, it talks about CRVO, BRVO, HRVO. Overall, 80% of them are BRVOs, and the median age is 65. We know that vision and age and baseline ischemia are predictors of outcomes and that the risk factors include your classic you know, cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerosis, and OAG. Nothing new there. So here's a cool OCTA picture here. And we know the treatment goals, we haven't changed a lot over time. We want to address those systemic risk factors, address the macular edema, and then treating neovascularization. Same thing has been for 10 years. But it gets more interesting when you actually look at the guidelines. And um, I remember there's really no really good definitive guidelines. So in my clinic in general, if a patient's over 50, I do send them to the internist to have a workup for their typical you know, hypertension, diabetes. But the trickier part is they're under 50. And this is a, a good Andy Shackett uh, pearl. He says, Steinle, don't ever order a test if you don't know what to do with it. So I used to order all those anticoagulation tests, right? And then they'd come back with these nebulous findings. I didn't know what to do with them. So now I send them to the hematologist or internist and let them order those tests. And so that's worked much better for me. And most of the time, it's even hard to interpret those. All right, this is kind of a cool arrow just to show you how far we've come with RVOs. And so starting over on the far side here, you had surgery. You had crazy stuff like you know fenestrations, lasers. Then you moved into, finally, some steroid injections. And then you moved into the anti-VEGF era. And I'll spend at the end of my time talking about the tip of the arrow and where we're going here, you know, after here. So this is the level one evidence we have today for anti-VEGF. We have Bravo Cruz for ranibizumab. We have a whole bunch of data now on bevacizumab. We have Copernicus Galilei and Vibrant for a flibercept. We have the steroid trials, SCORE, the dexamethasone implant, and then we have comparative trials as well. I won't go through all these, so don't worry. Uh, but I'll just hit some quick highlights. Uh, you guys know this, but the Bravo trial really taught us one thing, and that is that you shouldn't delay treatment. In the Bravo trial, there's two different arms of ranibizumab, two different doses. And there was sham. And the sham M couldn't get ranibizumab until month six. So at month six, they could finally get treated for the BRVO. And they finally got vision gains, but they never caught up to those people who got baseline ranibizumab. What this teaches us is not to delay care in these patients and treat them as soon as possible, because if you delay care, they can get visual improvements, but not ever catch up to those patients get baseline aggressive therapy. The other crazy thing is I was looking back at these, you know, Galileo and Copernicus for this presentation. These were only published 10 years ago. This is 2013, 2014. This is for CRVO, where the, the, the standard of care was observation. 
It's amazing just 10 years ago that we had a major clinical trial from a major pharma company, and the comparative arm was observation. And that's in a major, major clinical trial for both Copernicus and Galileo. It just kind of jogs your memory of how far we've come in the last 10 years. All right, so some obvious lessons we already know. Anti-VEGF work, don't delay treatment. And then how have things changed in my clinic now that I know these things, been known them for a while? And so we had a great talk earlier about wide field imaging, and I'll talk about it in a little bit. But these old studies, the BVO study, the CVO study, looking at ischemia. And for patients who have a BRVO and they have more than five disc areas of ischemia, that was an ischemic BRVO. And if they have more than 10 disc areas in a CRVO, that was an ischemic CRVO, and that was predictive in those studies. But that was based on seven field imaging. So this is your seven field imaging here, and you have about 30% of the retina you can image. And I, you know, I remember these, and even Cole used to do these, you know, seven field images, it took forever to get them, and then you get the montage together. And if you got this image, you were happy. That's a good image, right? But you know you're missing a lot of the retina. It's only seeing 30% of it. So if you move forward and look at that same patient with wide fields, you see those huge areas of peripheral non-perfusion. And this is, if you get the, the wide field imaging, you get 80% of the retina. Well, then you look, well, does that actually matter if you're missing that much retina? The answer is absolutely. So Rick Spade's always a really smart guy, and he looked at this and said, if you use ultra-wide field imaging, you pick up about 50% more of your patients are actually classified as ischemic. So if you don't use ultra-wide field, you use this typical seven field imaging, and you miss half your patients with an ischemic either BRBO or CRBO. We know that. Can you quantify this? And this is a cool slide that Yasha gave me here. Can you quantify this? Can you look at that peripheral areas of ischemia? Can you go through this? And there is something called this ischemic index. You can actually map out this peripheral areas of ischemia to look to see how much ischemia there actually is out there, more quantifying it. It gets tricky, though, and you guys know this in your, in your clinics. We have optos in all of our offices. And so if you look at those peripheral lesions, sometimes you see this giant horseshoe tear in the periphery, this giant, you know, looks like a giant melanoma. Then you actually look in the eye, and it's pretty small. Or the horseshoe tear is small, and you're like, oh boy, I, this isn't what I thought it was gonna be. And the reason why is you get this, this distortion when you go from a 2D image to a 3D image, and you get that peripheral distortion. So the circle here in yellow, which is B, and the circle there in pink, which is C, look the same, but if you look at the areas, it's almost double. So area B is almost double the area versus area C, just because you get that peripheral distortion. So remember that when you see those huge lesions in the periphery, some of it's just an artifact. So to correct for that, you have to do the stero uh, stereoscopic projection correction software, which is imperfect. So it's, it's hard to do this ischemic index in real life. All right, so what are the drugs on the horizon? So I got five minutes to talk about drugs. And this is, you know, just remember just a couple years ago, we were all riding the Brolucismat train, right? And I had a lot of my patients in these trials for Raptor and Raven. This was going to be for CRBO and BRBO. It's one of the first times in my life the trial was completely halted. They didn't even finish the trial. So these patients were exited out of the trial, and they had to go to my standard of care clinic. And so if you look at the Hippocrates and look for Brolucismat, it's on label for DME, it's on label for AMD, it's not on label for RBO because it got halted for both Raptor and Raven. All right, let's move forward to happier times. So this has really changed my clinic a lot, and these are actually the biosimilars now. You know, it's a whole new space for us now. It's the first biosimilar for ophthalmology was this one called BioViz, and it's ranibizumab. And it came out last July, and it's become more and more part of our practice over time. And the reason why is not because they have amazing new data, because you can extrapolate data. And I didn't know this concept, but when you have a biosimilar, it only has to go through one clinical trial. So if you look at the clinical trial data from Biogen, it's one AMD trial, and then the FDA allows you to extrapolate to all the different indications that they have for the 0.5 dosing. And so not to be outdone, the other bio, the biosimilar on the market right now is the Simerly, which is also ranibizumab. And if you look at their package insert here, you can see all the indications for Lucentis here, including, of course, RVO. All right, let's move forward to some new interesting molecules, and we've talked earlier about it, Dr. Orr talked about this a little bit, about frisimab. Frisimab is near and dear to my heart. My mom's on frisimab, um, and the studies that went through it for RVO, for BRVO, were Balaton and Camino. Those are now completely uh, enrolled and, and actually read out, and this is from February of 2023, talking about how good these are for RVO. Not surprising that it would work, and they're now going through the FDA approval process now for frisimab. And then not to be outdone, Regeneron, of course, is looking at high dose of Flibercept. And they now have applied for their uh, BLA and actually was accepted for review just on February of this year for DME and AMD. And that's looking at the Photon trial and the Pulsar trial. And of course, now their RVO trials are going forward for high dose of Flibercept. 
So in conclusion, and I'm right on time here, we're looking at anti-VEGF agents, and we know that they have durable visual acuity outcomes. Steroids work too. They just have a higher side effect profile. Even after all these years, we're still looking at baseline vision is probably the best predictor we have. And if you have a patient who has 2,400 worse vision at baseline, they're probably not gonna do a whole lot better. Although there's a ceiling for them to get somewhat better, they'll never quite get to that 2020 again. Biosimilars are now here. The ranibizumab biosimilars are here. We use them in our clinics. Um, and the other biosimilar for Flibercept is probably about a year out, and that'll be another you know, game changer for our field as well. Ferisumab phase three trials are completed for both CRVO and BRVO, and they've now submitted that data to the FDA. And then finally, the eight, eight milligram of Flibercept, you know, they've now had their, their, um, their AMD and their DME trials completed, and they're moving forward now with RVO trials. With that, thank you guys for the invitation, and I even stay within my 10 minutes. How about that? Nice job. Yeah. You get invited back, man. Nice work. <laughs> Questions from the panel uh, for eight? While people are thinking, so I'm going to ask you, uh, we have so many options. What's your choice for BRVO, 2080 vision, 400 micron CME? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so sad, but especially in California, we're so insurance dictated. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see more and more of that now with the biosimilars on panels as well. Um, most of our contracts are, are, are um, Avastin first, you know, Bevacizumab. And then if we can, then now they're actually moving mostly biosimilars. So, well. so in California, it's biosimilar after, after Bevacizumab. Yep. Interesting. And what, where does steroids fit in your, in your own treatment arm? Is, do you have a threshold? Is it pseudofakes? Is it after X number anti VEGFs? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Too. Oh, it's great. It's a good question. And I probably use them more quickly than I do. You know, I think all of us like anti VEGFs because they, you know, are very safe and they're very reliable. Um, but I do like the, either we, triamcinolone works well, especially the dexamethasone implant. And you know, after about three or four injections of an RVO patient, if I'm just not seeing much budge on their OCT, then I'll move forward to that. Excellent. All right, someone's listening to their um, hip hop music, which is always good on panel. <laughs> 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 Any other comments or questions? Yeah, awesome. I, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Um, Please, Judy. It's a little bit outside the uh, RBO, but uh, you're talking about biosimilars. Yeah. And um, as more biosimilars come on the market, and you already, we already have two, but uh, how do we know, as a physician, which patient has what insurance that has uh, what medication approved? Um, versus not, because I mean, uh, right now I don't even know, you, you know, what the patient's insurance status is. It's an extremely good question, and so you know, this the, for for BioVis for Biogen, it's really been interesting being involved with the company because there, this is you know, there's 36 biosimilars now on the market in general across all different markets for rheumatology, neurology. So 36. So so this is not something new, but it's new to us. And so in the other spaces, say oncology, they spend a lot of time making sure that patient has the right insurance to get the right drug to that patient. Because as you said, there might be several different biosimilars for a certain chemotherapy. And if they choose the wrong one, they said they can, use, they can lose almost a month of profit sometimes um, if they get the wrong, if they put the person in the wrong bucket. So I think that unfortunately, we're gonna have more and more um, delays and less same day treatments for our patients. How about the flip side? What about stocking all these at all your offices? Uh, good question. So fridge space is a real deal. So we have 13 <laughs> offices, and right now we basically have dorm fridges, so like those little tiny little <laughs> dorm fridges, you know? And so I appreciate it when the companies come out with tiny little boxes now because we can fit more in there. But your point's well taken because you don't know what time a patient's going to show up with their certain insurance. And if you don't have that certain drug, it takes time to get that drug to that clinic at the right temperature for that right patient. That's difficult. It'd be easier to stock that all, but that's a real concern for us. Yeah. Awesome. That's a real world concern. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like we're going to have to get a giant fridge each place with the ice machine <laughs> on it. Right. All right. Excellent, Nate. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, <laughs> next is Alexandra Rachaskaya talking to us about new approaches to treatment of DME and diabetic retinopathy. Take it away. So, before I start, just want to remind everybody about the social media contest. And I can see it all because apparently I'm tagged in all of them. You, and you are the, the most It's perfect. fierce. It's fierce. So if you if you want to participate for AirPods or uh, Apple Watch, the uh, hashtag is there. It is Coli Retina Summit, and also tag uh, Ivista Medical Education. All right, and we can go to my presentation. So these are my disclosures. And I'm going to give you kind of a landscape of what's happening in diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. We'll talk about some imaging, some uh, established drugs, some new drugs, and some novel approaches. 
So when it comes to imaging, probably the most uh, recent uh, report we have is from DRCR protocol AA. And it's been touched upon that, you know, we used to use uh, seven modified fields, and now we have uh, ultra-wide field that about allows us to see about 82% of the retina. So this study was interesting because they looked in the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy at something called predominantly peripheral lesions. So these are your hemorrhages and venous beating. And the finding was uh, surprising because it showed that when you look at color, uh, uh, ultra-wide field imaging, and you have your pr pr predominantly peripheral lesions, there was no association with progression. But when you saw them on the fluorescein angiography, it was associated with a greater risk of disease worsening over four years, independent of their baseline diabetic retinopathy severity score. So I, I invite you, and we'll talk a little bit more maybe in the, in the panel discussion, to think maybe we should be getting more fluorescein angiography on our non-proliferative patients. So what about uh, established anti-VEGF agents? We have DRCR net protocol AC that looked at the aflibercept uh, versus uh, starting with bevacizumab and uh, then switching to aflibercept as needed. So we all know the results of the protocol T uh, that showed that if you look at patients who are 20, 50 or worse, uh, both at year one and year two, the patients who were on aflibercept did better than those uh, who were on bevacizumab. But the question always remained, what about what about patients if you start first on bevacizumab? As a lot of us, and Nathan alluded to it, you know, we're not always choosing what drug to start with. So this was the idea behind AC. Patients were started on bevacizumab, and then they were able to be switched to aflibercept. The primary endpoint was mean change in visual acuity from baseline through two years. So area under the curve looking at vision over the two years, and there was no difference uh, when it came to patients who were started on aflibercept first or patients who were switched to aflibercept from bevacizumab. Interestingly, though, in the, during the duration of the study, 70% of patients who were in the bevacizumab group were switched to aflibercept. Moreover, 57%, so more than half of these patients, were switched when it was first, uh, they were first eligible to switch due to uh, the design of the study between 12 and 24 weeks. So established therapeutic, but a different twist, high dose of Libercept uh, has been alluded to. And when it comes to diabetic macular edema, we have the photon study. And uh, it's a novel formulation uh, that delivers uh, eight milligrams of a Libercept in uh, 70 microliters. And it's a four times higher molar dose, so potentially leading to uh, longer efficacy. Uh, the photon study was designed to have your standard of care. So uh, a flipper said two milligrams every eight weeks after five loading doses. And then you had your um, eight milligrams. Uh, first group was every 12 weeks after three monthly loading doses and eight milligrams every 16 weeks after the three initial monthly dosing. The primary endpoint was change in BCVA. This is, was non-inferiority study. And we also had a proportion of patients with two or more st uh, step improvement on the DRSS score. So this is just looking again at the study design, and uh, there, there are listed other criteria when patients could be uh, switched to a more shortened interval, and once they were shortened, they couldn't go back. So in terms of the primary endpoint, it was met in both of the eight milligram groups. Uh, their visual acuity was non-inferior compared to the standard of care at week 48. And the, 12, uh, and the every 12 week group also met non-inferiority margin of 15% when it came to the proportion of patients with two or more step improvement. This is looking at the patients who were able to maintain at particular intervals, and uh, if we look, 93% uh, of patients on high-dose ILEA were maintained on dosing intervals of 12 or more weeks. Uh, we heard about frisimab as it applies to new vascular AMD, and as we know, it targets um, ENG2. So just for those of you who are not familiar, ENG1 is the uh, normal um, molecule released from platelets, and it basically stabilizes the blood vessels. And when you have ENG2, it competes with ENG1 and uh, causes vascular instability by blocking this ENG1 tie 2 signaling. 
And that's what thought to play a role both in your vascular AMD and uh, DME and RVO. So Yosemite and Rhine were the pivotal trials looking at the role of risimab in DME. And the study design, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. We have all these new studies, and each study has a very particular designs. So here we have a flibercept as our standard of care, and there was furisimab, six milligrams delivered every eight weeks after loading doses, and then there was furisimab, six milligrams with a personalized, personalized treatment interval. And um, we can look at the details, but basically it's like a treat and extend approach. And uh, the study showed that both at one a year, which was primary endpoint, and two years, we have uh, robust vision gains that they were maintained. And also, the same was applicable to the CST changes. And here's another pie chart looking at the uh, patients who were able to stay on these longer intervals. And we can see both 52 weeks and 96 weeks, and 80% achieved uh, more than 12-week dosing. Uh, this is the uh, uh, um, adverse events of special interest, actually looking both at Tenial de Cern and Yosemite and Rhine, and you can see that there was no uh, retinal vasculitis events, and you can see also the intraocular inflammation events listed here. So what about gene therapy when it comes to uh, diabetic uh, disease? So just similar, you know, gene therapy... There's so many different types of gene therapy. When we talk about diseases such as neovascular AMD or diabetes or GA, we talk about having a gene encoding for a protein of interest. So basically, you're creating a biofactory in the eye. So uh, historically, we had two, um, two companies working on the gene therapy for uh, diabetic eye disease. And we'll focus on RGX314, um, which is uh, delivered um, both subretinally and supracoroidally, and uh, there was ADVM022, uh, which was delivered intravitreally. Unfortunately, the adverum ended the DME style because patients developed uh, a very rapid and very clinically significant hypotony that was not responding to uh, treatments, and these events occurred 16 to 36 weeks, but this was intravitreal injection. So when we talk about uh, RGX314, uh, this is encoding for antivagf fab molecule, and there's uh, both a new vascular AMD and a diabetic retinopathy study. So all the new vascular AMD studies uh, are listed here, subretinal. There's also a suprachoroidal new vascular AMD uh, trial, but focusing here on diabetic retinopathy, the diabetic retinopathy trial is suprachoroidal, and it's diabetic retinopathy, not diabetic macular edema. So they're looking at patients uh, who have uh, diabetic retinopathy and the proportion of patients with more than two-step improvement in the diabetic retinopathy severity scale. So this is the design. Uh, there is uh, several cohorts of uh, different dosing, and also uh, there's patients who are neutralizing uh, antibody positive uh, and negative. And this is uh, the data from month six, and we can see here that compared to control, patients have uh, significantly more uh, two-step improvement in the uh, cohorts that are treated. Once again, uh, we always worry about uh, adverse events. So these are, there was no ad adverse events of vasculitis or retinal or retinal occlusion, no uh, hypotony. Uh, there has been some events uh, of inflammation that were controlled with topical uh, treatments. So we, this is exciting. We'll have to see what the data continues to show. Um, so far, we see pretty good, pretty good safety profile, and we do see improvement in the RSS scores. I do want to touch about on uh, port delivery system. Um, a port delivery system was approved in October 21 uh, for new vascular AMD. Uh, as of October of uh, last year, there was a voluntary recall uh, based on septum dislodgement. And just for those of you who have never seen a port delivery system, this is the surgery to put the implant in. And this is how the implant is refilled in clinic. And I'm going to just highlight the results of the Pagoda and Pavilion trial. So the Pagoda trial was for patients with diabetic macular edema. 
And these patients were, um, had the implant and then they were treated uh, with refill every 24 weeks compared to monthly ranibizumab. And when we look at the primary endpoint of uh, known inferiority in terms of uh, best corrected visual acuity, it was met in the uh, port delivery system uh, arm. This is the um, a series of adverse events uh, of special interest. And here we see that there was uh, one case of septum dislodgement and one implant dislocation, but there was actually no endophthalmitis cases in this uh, group of patients. And this is just the summary that the PDS did meet the primary endpoint. And also pavilion, looking at the patients with diabetic retinopathy. So here we had the implant and then the refill happened at 36 weeks, so later. And the con control was uh, observation with treatment as needed uh, for any changes in those patients. And pavilion as well met the primary endpoint uh, in terms of uh, patients achieving more than two-step DRSS improvement. These are uh, ocular adverse events of special interest, and we uh, see that there was uh, no cases of uh, endophthalmitis, no case cases of impend dislodgement or septum dislodgement in this cohort of patients. And this is just the summary, once again, showing that the pavilion also met its primary endpoint. So we'll have to see if uh, PDS is coming back. So this is a kind of a bird eye view of everything that's happening in the DR and DME space. This is exciting time. We talked about imaging. We talked about the drugs that we do have, the, dr the new drugs. And we also talked about novel approaches. So I look forward to the discussion. Questions, comments? I'll ask you a question. So, you know, I was really excited for the panorama data, and I do treat patients just for DR. Do you ever treat just for DR without DME? So that's an excellent question. In fact, um, we'll, we'll discuss it further during the panel discussion. Um, I think it's, you know, I, I was actually surprised by the finding of protocol AA because I don't know how you guys and, and we can talk. I usually don't get fluorescein angiography on those patients, right? Uh, unless I really suspect that there might be some uh, PDR hiding that I'm not seeing, you know, some of those eyes, um, it's hard to tell sometimes. But it, it made me wonder, maybe we should be getting more aphase, and then if patients have this predominantly peripheral lesions, maybe we should be treating them more aggressively. I don't have the answer for that, and there's no study really show, showing that. There's no study like that. But it did make me pause and think, maybe uh, these patients are somehow different and more at risk. But the uh, protocol W uh, showed that there was no difference in terms of visual care outcome after four years of follow-up that you can intervene when the complications occur. Yeah. What do you think about that? I, uh, exactly. You guys are stealing my panel. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have nothing to talk about. We'll have plenty to talk about. Always do. No, I'm just kidding. But I think, you know, it's interesting because, um, like Judy said, the protocol, Panorama and Protocol W are kind of these, you know, they should be in a boxing match. Uh, but. I think the, the one concern I always have about uh, patients is, um, diabetic patients in particular, is follow-up. You know, these patients in clinical trials, those of you who participate in clinical trials, we make sure the patients show up. You know, we call them, we like send letters, you know, uh, we send our fellows to get, go get them. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes I do pause and think about the patients progressing. How would it be in real world? You know, so I think, uh, I think that's uh, always, always a variable when it comes to taking the clinical trial and taking it to clinic. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. Alexandra. <laughs> Next is going to be uh, Danny Mao from Cole Institute. He's going to talk to us about OCTA and diabetic retinopathy and AMD, and he's going to talk about all the novel software that Nate Steinle can use in his office. Yeah, I need it. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, thanks to Sunil, uh, PK, and Alexandra for uh, inviting me to speak today. This is going to be a real-world OCTA talk. Um, I don't get paid by any of the companies. A lot of the images we're going to see are not going to be that great, but they're going to be, I'll show you how they're useful in my clinic. Um, I also do uveitis, so I, I don't uh, think that OCTA is going to be a replacement for FA anytime soon. I, I love my FA, but I think it can be a useful adjunct to clinical practices we'll see here today. Obviously, there's been an explosion of OCTA interest in the past decade. And, uh, you know, this is a recent PAT survey from this past year. 
you can see in the blue line there that over every single year, just now over 40% of specialists have access and find OCTA useful in practice. So it's growing year by year. And we all know that the image you see there, the type 2C in VM, is a beautiful image. That's what you see at all the meetings. But in real, pr real practice, what we see is that other image. And how do we, uh, how do we make the OCTA that we have in our clinic um, useful for us? So we do know that OCTA can improve detection, specifically when it comes to type 1C and VM. Sensitivity is close to 100%. Those are the ones that are a little bit easier to identify, and OCTA can be very help helpful with, and you get less of the issue of like projection artifacts. So quick basics for some of the um, you know, fellows and uh, med students in the audience. OCTA uses motion of red blood cells against a static background to identify retinal vessels. You have ONFOS images, which beautifully visualize vascular networks. And then you also need to correlate them with the B-scan images to pinpoint their location and look at the flow. And you really need to look at these pictures together. You can't just look at one to get a, you know, a great idea of, what's, idea of what's going on. You can uh, segment those B-scan images to produce beautiful ONFOS images of different layers. So the superficial retinal plexus, the deep retinal plexus, the outer retina, which is normally avascular, and the choriocapillaris. And then you can have these orc slabs that combine the outer retina and the choriocapillaris, which, which I like to use. So quickly, the benefits, you know, you visualize flow. You have these beautiful 3D images that FA can't provide of the deep retina and also the choriocapillaris and the choroid. It's obviously non-invasive, and um, you don't need to rely on a dye injection. The images are sharp, and they're not obscured by dye leakage, which, you know, for me as a uveitis specialist, uh, you know, is unfortunate for uveitis patients, but for AMD and DR, we'll see how it can be useful. Uh, limitations are that it's a slower imaging than just getting a structure, structural OCT. It requires high-speed instruments and higher and higher speed uh, um, instruments like swept source uh, machines require longer processing and saving times. The slow flow and flow impairment can't be detected, so you can't look at the quote unquote transit times that you might look for for delayed and like artery occlusions. And then there are limitations for peripheral non-perfusion that hopefully will improve if we get wider scans. You can't assess vascular permeability as we discussed. You can have artifacts, and then obviously there's some reimbursement issues. Practically, we have, uh, we've had two shortages in the past few years, one during COVID and then one more recently when one of the companies stopped, stopped producing fluorescein. We also all work in satellite clinics that don't always have fluorescein angiography or ICG available to us. So it would behoove us as retina specialists to be able to get comfortable using OCTA as an adjunct to help better manage our patients. So this is going to be a talk on how I practically use OCTA in my clinic. This first case is, uh, uh, first, I'm not going to talk about dark halos, filigree patterns, lacy networks, vessel density. Uh, you can read about that in some book that my colleagues have produced that most people seem to like. A few people wrote it four out of five stars. Do you know who the four stars from? Probably you and not Yasha. Is Kaiser. Kaiser wrote this down. No doubt about it. I didn't get a free copy. You, uh, you got to pay for it, man. I've seen your I'm disclosures. An author. I should get a free copy. No, you so don't get one. One reason that I like it is it helps you figure out if an exudative CNVM is present. So this is a patient with a wet AMD in the right eye getting injections. The left eye has dry AMD. The patient's 2060. This is an FA at that visit. Um, is that really leakage inferiorly or is this just staining of a low-lying PED? Here's the OCTA at that visit of the left eye. Then the patient comes back with a decline in vision of 2080. A little more hyperfluorescence there, as you can see. In this case, you don't really totally need OCTA. You see the OCT changed here. The PED becomes more of a broad, low-lying PED, double layer sign. You see some intraretinal fluid overlying it there. And then uh, temporally, you see some subretinal fluid. So you could probably make the guess with a decrease in vision. You don't need OCTA here. But you see a net develop nicely there, and this is the ORC slab. And I find that actually looking at the OCT images has helped me look at OCT B scans better, helped me really look at those PEDs and how they change and recognize those low, broad, low-lying PEDs. This is another patient with a history of wet AMD in the left eye and dry AMD in the right eye who's 2020. Six weeks prior, they looked like this. So we see a change in the low-lying PED. And this is not a great image. But we see that on this uh, um, segmented slab, we see some red flow within that PED that makes you confirm that that overlying SREM, even though I don't see any subretinal or intraretinal fluid, with the decline in vision, suggested that SREM is probably an active CNVM and was injected in a nice resolution of the SREM in this patient. You have to be careful when looking at OCTAs. You know, just like FA can have some questionable areas, is that leakage or is that not? Patients with large PEDs can lead to easy segmentation errors. And then large areas of geographic atrophy can make you be fooled that you're seeing membranes, but really all you're seeing is the underlying choroidal vessels that are, look, that are appearing in the superficial slabs. 
Another useful uh, possible thing for OCTA is uh, how high risk are my dry AMD patients, which is going to become more relevant here as we start looking to treat these patients. So Phil Rosenfeld has done good work looking at non-exudative uh, subclinical neovascularization lesions. So these are patients who don't have any signs of intraretinal or subretinal fluid, but they have these non-exudative nets. So they looked at a meta-analysis of uh, reported cases, and they found that the presence of a subclinical net in fellow eyes of wet AMD patients had, ba based on the study, a 6 to 27 percent chance of producing exudation within a few years. The incidence of exudation over these times is 20 to 80 percent. Oh, sorry, the presence of a net was 6 to 27 percent, and then the incidence of exudation over time was 20 to 80 percent. So. We're, not, we're all worried about these GA drugs potentially causing a CNVM. So can OCTA be used to stratify appropriate candidates? This is something that's, you know, we're going to rely on our industry partners. We're going to, you know, when pe more people start using these medications, we're going to have to be looking at these patients. And OCTA can be a very helpful to figure out if having a net um, increases a CNVM risk, or perhaps, as some have reported, do they actually slow down adjacent or overlying GA? So we don't really have full answers to these questions, but we're going to have to look into them. This study characterized nuanced exudation in patients uh, receiving pexetacoplan, and they state that exudative AMD seemed to be associated with baseline exudative AMD in the contralateral eye, as expected, but also a double layer sign suggestive of a non-exudative macular neovascularization lesion in the study eye. So suggestive, but not confirmed with OCTA. So we're going to have to really look at the OCTAs of these patients to see if they can help guide us in stratifying these patients. Now, how about looking at AMD mimickers? One of my favorite things to do is diagnose not AMD when I'm referred to AMD. So this is a patient with CSR. Look at the ORC slab. We see the green flow within the PED, and we see a nice CNVM confirming this is not just a CSR subretinal fluid, but that this is actually a CNVM that is developed. This is Mac Talon, a 44-year-old patient I saw. Um, is this is a new CNVM. He comes in with a new vision changes. We beautifully see in the ORC slab that there's flow in this uh, new subretinal lesion and uh, there is a nice net there, and he was treated with resolution of his CNVM. This is a 32-year-old woman with MACTEL, similar story. We see the nice MACTEL uh, temporal uh, telangiectasias and flow voids there, and then we see in the ORC slab and the B scan with the flow overlay that there's flow in that, in that uh, subretinal lesion. And how about is it even AMD? This is a 71-year-old male referred for 2040-2050 vision. I didn't really think the OCT or the imaging showed that type of vision. Here's the OCT of the right and left eye, respectively, mild drusen. You normally just send this patient out, come back in six months, maybe take AREDs, maybe not, stop smoking. Got OCTA, the superficial slabs were all normal, so was the deep. But on the choriocapillaris, you see some flow voids there in the right eye and the left eye. I don't have ICG in all my places, so sent the patient for ICG and has a um, dense hypofluorescent lesion in the macula of both eyes. This patient got a diagnosis of persistent plaquid maculopathy and gets immunosuppression instead of getting every six months checks. So practical takeaways for AMD, is there an exudative CNVM? How can I risk stratify my dry AMD patients? Assess for CNVM and AMD mimickers, and then raise suspicion for non-AMD disease. We'll quickly go through DR here. So DR is very helpful with these wider scans that we get, these 12 by 12s or 15 by 15s. They can be very helpful in assessing uh, ischemia, and then practically, for the average retina specialist, what do we mostly care about in a DR patient? We care about their A1C. We care about if, is there DME or not? Is there neovascularization or not? And the ischemic burden. All of these decide what you're going to do in the clinic with the patient right in front of you. So how do we decide these things very quickly? And how can OCTA help us? So this is a 53-year-old man with very well-controlled PDR, but he's 2080 in the right eye. He's 2050 in the left eye. We all have these patients. My A1C is good. What's wrong with my vision? Why am I not seeing well? Well, it's because you can show the patient beautifully that they have enlarged foveal vascular zones that's affecting their vision. So it's a great teaching tool for patients. And then how about, this is the interesting one, how about diagnosing NVD and NVE? Are we going to have to rely on fluorescein for all these patients? John Russell and Phil Rosenfeld have done great work looking at um, diabetic neovascularization. So in this study, they did a montage wide field OCTA, compared it with PDR patients uh, with FA confirmed uh, of neovascularization. And they found that 98% of eyes detected neovascularization within the montage. But Dr. Steinle is seeing 100 patients a day. He doesn't have time <laughs> to montage, OK? So this new study from last year looked at a single scan, 60 degrees. And they found that there was a 95% sensitivity in detecting PDR in FA-confirmed in FA PDR patients. 
This is a nice example of a 30-year-old woman with PDR in both eyes. She deferred any fluorescein testing due to pregnancy. So we beautifully see in these images a very ischemic burden. And then here's the image you get. It's not that great, but this is the VRI slab, visceral retinal interface. So are these lesions real? This is where I said you have to correlate it with the B-scan overlay. So let's scroll over that area, mm -hmm. and we see that there's mild red flow in that lesion that was kind of lighting up in the VRI, and this lady has a neovascularization, neovascular lesion there. And here's a 12 by 12 image. The other one was 6 by 6, showing something similar. And then this is more interesting. So this is the VRI image of her left eye. Are any of these real? This is why it's very important to correlate with the B-scan. So let's look at this image at the bottom uh, left there. So this is not real. This is segmentation error. That's why it's showing up as something in the other, in the, uh, that's why it's showing up in the VRI slab there. But if we scroll over to the superior one and correlate it to the B-scan image, we see that this one's real. There's flow. This is a neovascular uh, lesion, neovascularization elsewhere. You know what you're going to do for this patient. PRP or anti-VEGF combo. So OCTA and DR can be a great teaching tool for patients. It's quick, can assess macular ischemia, and uh, with comfortable use, it can be actually, has a really high increased sensitivity for NV diagnosis with wider imaging. Thank you. Great questions, comments? Have, have we solved it, Neat? Are you ready? Oh, Yasha's got something to say. Go ahead, Yasha. No, nothing to say. Oh, I, I, just, I love that talk, it was great. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. I, so I got a question. So you, you know, you've got your patient with uh, non uh, uh neovascular AMD that's symptomatic. You do your OCTA, and you see that little net on there. Are you treating or are you not treating? No. So I think right now the, the current data shows that we're not suggesting treatment for these non exited lesions, probably just closer follow-up. And then again, if we start treating them with complement inhibitors, you know, no one really knows the guidance there. But... I don't know what I'm going to do. I'd probably not start the common inhibitor maybe in those patients, or I would just watch them even closer. I'll, I'll piggyback. It's a great question, Matt. So, so I'll ask Sunil to submit this question. So, so in Philly, Oaks, Derby, there's a dose-dependent. When you inhibit complement, you have exudation. What's the mechanism? Why do you, why do you think it happens? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was eating a chocolate-covered raisin. Yeah. Um, I don't thanks think thanks for not asking me that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Saved you, Danny. I don't think anyone knows the answer. I mean, in, in, in all straightforwardness, could be random. Um, but uh, I, I, my guess is that this is a very complicated process where complement at some level is inhibiting uh, growth. And now that you're blocking complement, now you're going to see it. I mean, that's the simplest way of thinking of it. Do I have any evidence of it? Of course not. Um, but the fact that it's played out in multiple studies at least it proves to me uh, some in this dose-dependent uh, increase in it that there is a role that complement plays in CNV. So can I explain it? No, but it seems like every data point right now that we have seems to support it. Can Actually, I? I, oh, you know, one of the, uh, the, for the panelists, how many of you think that type 1 neovascularization inhibits geographic atrophy? Anyone you, on the panel? I think... I Protective. I, Anyone think uh, it's protective? So this kind of came out of a theory from Bailey Freund and has been sort of reported also by Giuseppe Kerkis. And there's a, a fair amount of uh, papers looking at that. And actually, you know, it's interesting because you look at a, a thin double layer sign mm -hmm. on the OCT. And if you look at an OCTA that becomes, and you identify that that's non-neovascular, that's a risk factor for GA, the thin double layer sign. On the other hand, if you have a thick double layer sign, and the terminology probably could be a little bit clearer in the literature, but if you use the OCTA and you identify that there's type 1 neovascularization, especially if it's subphobial, I would argue those are probably patients I'm less likely to treat with complement inhibition because that in itself can be intrinsically protective. If I can go back to the OCTA on diabetic retinopathy side, one of the problems we're facing is with longitudinal data. You can see uh, non-ischemia on an image, and then next visit, that gets perfused. And next visit, it's non-perfused again. There's a vitreous floater that blocks. Maybe the patient's head is tilted a little bit, it blocks. It some, comes some of it is flow-related, too, right? So, so the, if there's, there's not enough flow, it'll look ischemic, and it, there's actually flow there. True. It could be a real flow problem, too, but you never know. I mean, in fact, we had a med student who, 
who would say, okay, we, where do you want the non-perfusion? And he would position his head accordingly and give us that image of non-perfusion. <laughs> <laughs> he became an expert in it. So, you know, all the studies that Alexandra presented, they all have OCTAs. Not one of them has enough longitudinal data for meaningful conclusions. Yeah, that's a great point. It is very challenging to interpret. The, the adaptive optics also will show that you have intermittent flow as well, right? So you have capillaries that flow, and then one moment there'll be there'll be you know, a single layer of red blood cells going through, and then the next one they won't. So I think to your point, that's a, there's a lot left to be learned about that. Yeah, some studies have uh, recommended you do averaging because mm -hmm. of that flow issue, because you know you're getting moment in, in time, but if you average, then you may get you know um, more flow, um, but. The, the positioning, I think, is also a, a, a very important factor. Excellent. Great stuff. <laughs> so next is our moderator, Sunil Srivastava, who is an expert in this topic of inflammatory complications in clinical trials. Um, thanks, Peter. Uh, we are going to finish on time, so just so everyone knows, we're going to move things around on some of the panels and such, and we'll shorten some stuff. We probably won't get the second break, but everyone wanted to see Peter anyway, so this is, this is better. Here are my financial disclosures. Um, inflammation, aka uveitis. Uh, honestly, I'm not everyone's favorite person. I accept that. That's my reality. And it's just not something for the cool nerds of ophthalmology. This is something that strikes fear in most of the ophthalmologists. When it's expected, I think we're all comfortable with it. Post-surgery, post-infection, we expect some inflammation. When it's unexpected, you see an AMD patient, all of a sudden they have inflammation after you gave them an injection. It's confusing, troubling, and scary. And what am I missing? And can someone lose vision permanently? In the last few years, inflammatory complications have been something that we've seen in a number of products, Brilocizumab, Abicapar, gene therapy trials. So let me show you a case. I think we all know this story very well. Nevascular AMD getting anti-VEGF injections, new vision loss after injections has had serial bevacizumab injections every seven to eight weeks. I believe this is Alexandra's patient. Heads down south for the winter, bevacizumab injection times two while down south, not in Cleveland. Vision drops after the second injection to 2,400. Here's the look when they come back to Cleveland because they need to get this taken care of acutely, and they're 2,125 now with a significant amount of cell and hemorrhages in the periphery. So uh, the fluorescein just highlights the ischemic peripheral vasculitis process that's occurring. The disc is hot. There's a fair amount of inflammation in the side. This was a case of brilocizumab associated inflammation with vasculitis and non-perfusion. It's hard to believe this is 2020, three years ago. It's a crazy year. Lots of things happened in 2020. But we all heard rumors of inflammation in late 2019. There was even a hint of it in the clinical trials. And by early 2020, there were social media postings about a concerning case. It was one case that then exploded to there are several cases. And then the paper came out. I'm oh, sorry, first the BV update came from ASRS, and then um, Caroline Baumel's paper came out uh, following. So initially, when we saw these things, the safety update was 14 cases of vasculitis, 11 which were occlusive. When Novartis press release, they saw that there was four cases per 10,000 injections as of August 2020. Um, at that point in time, all these cases now got put together, and a couple of interesting things were found. Probably the most interesting that was found when you started looking at these fundus photos was the number of cases that had this peripheral vasculitis. And I'm going to highlight that, peripheral vasculitis, because it comes important when we talk about why, how this happened, and how do we miss it. And as you look at these angiograms, you can see there are a fair uh, amount of non-perfusion that occurs in the periphery. And this is after a patient presents that they're getting a fluorescein. Not necessarily a study protocol fluorescein, but a fluorescein nevertheless. Novartis uh, convened a safety review committee, which included a couple people on this panel, and we went through all the cases. And it turned out, as you looked at these cases, and it looked at the cases of inflammation in the study, it was actually a higher rate than I think that was initially described when you carefully looked at the images. And when you looked at patients who developed inflammation, there was a 10% risk. If you developed inflammation, of severe vision loss, losing more than 30 letters. Even just mild vision loss of losing more than 15, which I still think is a fair amount, it was about 16%. The other thing that was obvious is that this could happen at any point in time. This curve shows nicely when these time to event curves would occur, and you could see this inflammation that would occur at many points in time, not just in the first few months, but occurred even out to 12 to 14 to 18 months. So, why did this occur, or how did we miss it? You know, my, this is my take. This is my take on this, is that inflammation, I think, was present in some of these cases, 
on imaging, but not, may have not been recognized, and retreatment occurred. So you primed the eye, they got another treatment, reprimed that eye, and then the second or third one, that's when a horrible case, a retinal occlusive uh, disease occurred. These things could occur um, even 12 to 18 months later, telling you that this is something that cumulatively can occur in some of these eyes. And severe vision loss is possible once it starts. So it mandates that you come at it with a aggressive therapy. So what lessons did, uh, did I take away from this? We suck at grading inflammation, period. We're really poor. We got bad equipment. A slit lamp in a, re in a retina office is about as good as a pen light. Most of the time, people aren't having these things as bright as they need. There are fast exams, carotid precipitates are missed, cells are missed, and then imaging is not being reviewed by clinicians because we have our AMD mind, or DME mind. Is the fluid better or worse? Not whether or not there are cells on the OCT. What about the reading center? Because the reading center sees these images. Well, the, all these images aren't necessarily read together. An OCT, a fundus photo, and fluorescein aren't looked at at the same time at the same patient to kind of assess it like we do in the uveitis clinic. We look at all these things together. And you're not looking for subtle signs of inflammations. And maybe it's not clinicians who are looking at images. People who are masked and not unable to use the clinical information that would be helpful in determining what's happening. I'll show you just a, a case of a photo. Here's a baseline and a study visit. So study visit, I'm not gonna tell you when or which drug or what, what's happening, but I'm just gonna tell you that this is a baseline and study visit. You look at this just by itself, you say, well, okay, I don't think there's much going on. Notice it's a 30 degree photo. I showed you the baseline and study visit fluorescein, it's really subtle. But if you look at that disc on the right-hand side of that study visit, that disc is hot, that disc is inflamed. And it's not until you compare that disc to the other disc that all of a sudden it becomes obvious that this eye is actually having inflammation. These are the type of cases that are easily missed in a clinical trial because we're looking, looking at this in one time point and not really looking at it in continuum with other time points. So the lessons, I think, are continued. Subtle low rates of inflammation in controlled clinical trials, not necessarily what will occur in the real world. Remember, the clinical trial patient is the ideal, quote unquote, patient. Lots of more patients that get in the real world will, have, will be primed for inflammation. They'll have history of systemic inflammatory disease. They'll be post-surgery. They're previously treated patients. They're sicker patients. They're on medications that promote inflammatory disease. Inflammation could, rates could also improve at times because manufacturing also improves. And inflammatory complications can occur months later. Thus the hesitation, I think, sometimes for some of us to use some new medications. What if something is gonna happen later on? Do we need to wait? Do we need to be careful before we use some new medications? This is also true in some of the things we're seeing in gene therapy. Chronic inflammation is gonna be concerning and can be concerning. Some inflammation is expected in all gene therapy programs. I don't think we know yet what the best way to manage it and we're not clear on its long-term effects. Clearly, there are some diseases that have horrible long-term complications, that having a little bit of inflammation is probably not a big deal. However, there are other diseases that maybe inflammation is worse than the disease itself. For all those who are in, the, uh, in this field, there's some great work and great like, roundtables to discuss it, but essentially what you take away from this is that we don't really know a lot. We know that inflammation is seen in almost every animal study. Histologic changes in cellular inflammation occurs even in the absence of clinically apparent inflammation. Even if you use immunosuppressive pretreatment uh, and it varies widely, it's not clear how much of an effect it can have on these animal models, and it's not well aligned with clinical protocols. If you look at almost every gene therapy um, trial, at some level there's some form of inflammation. Somebody will report it, somebody will may not. But in this review, 17 of 29 pro trials had some form of inflammation. 10 of these were significant. And if 10 are significant, I'm gonna tell you the other seven are probably significant because we do a terrible job of grading it. This is the world of grading inflammation on studies, safety studies. This is how it's determined. It's the number of cells that are seen, the amount of flare, not necessarily by, based on imaging, not necessarily based on a, a UVI specialist assessing this patient, by just cellular metrics. And sometimes that's not precise <clears throat> enough. And in diseased eyes, like RP or uh, um, other uh, retinal dystrophies, some of these eyes have already been primed. What do I mean by that? Their blood retinal barrier has already been destroyed because of the natural history of the disease. Most of these uh, patients will have some inflammatory cells. You can see them on clinical exam, and some of them already have anti-retinal antibodies that we know exist. So are these eyes primed for an immune response? <laughs> don't forget, your diabetic patients probably also have some vascular changes that also may mimic 
some changes that we're seeing in retinal dystrophies as well. So in all likelihood, all gene therapy is going to lead to inflammation. Regardless of the location of vector type, we're probably going to miss it. So the best thing you could do is overimage and probably be ready for it. So overtreat these eyes and recognize we don't know how to do it for long. Alex referred to this a little bit. If you look at even Voreda gene and you look at some of the changes that have been seen in the long-term phase of this, some of these things we don't understand why this occurs. So a really lovely paper that came out of the group in uh, Denmark that actually looked at their patients who got, received Voreda gene and looked at these changes in the outer retina. What they found was actually inflammation incurred in like 9 out of 23 patients. And in those patients that developed inflammations, many of them developed these uh, retinal infiltrates that then became atrophy that was seen later on. And if I showed you these images really, really carefully, it looks very, very similar to other inflammatory diseases that we deal in the uveitis clinic. So we've seen, both in altitude and we'll see it also in aviate, there are mild forms of inflammation that are seen, controlled with proper pretreatment, proper treatment at the time that still allow really good outcomes. So one of the things I think that takes home from this is that every trial has to be ready for some inflammation. And as you increase the dose, as you increase the exposure population to include patients who maybe have antibodies that are positive, you have to be ready for some sort of inflammation. One of the ones that also has occurred, and we've talked about a little bit, is adverum. And what's interesting about the adverum inflammatory complications was that this was dose-dependent, and the first sign of it was really low eye pressure. Hypotony was the first thing that was really seen. Although AC inflammation was seen, as you can see here as the heat map, showing that in the DME patients, these were more likely to get inflammation, it was really hypotony that really highlighted when, what was happening in these patients. So if you look at the study eye in the high-dose version of uh, Infinity, those were the eyes that were most likely to get some form of inflammatory complications and hypotony. Some of these eyes actually re required significant amount of uh, control. This eye in particular needed a vitrectomy, oil, and a redisert placement in order to control this eye. And you can see on the picture all the way on the right that there are changes of the iris that show just the amount of inflammation that was occurring. This is a, a little bit seen a little bit better on this image here where you can see some of these changes within the mm -hmm. retina itself. So from that, I think you, there's a learning opportunity. Okay, these are the patients that are high risk. This is dose dependent. This requires us, if we're going to continue this gene therapy program, to improve our monitoring and improve our understanding of this. So that means real time monitoring. That means getting other clinicians involved. That means changing the way you do the immunosuppressive regimen of these patients in the early stages and to probably go at a lower dose, which are all the things that the, this company has done. So here's my take. All new therapies, you got to counsel patients on symptoms. Pain, redness, light sensitivity, floaters, drop in vision. You got to use a slit lamp that works. Use imaging if you don't know. Get an ultra wide field fluorescein angiography if you're down. Do it and look for leakage, look for an occlusion. And rule out infectious causes when you see inflammatory co complications. And if you're not sure, tap and inject and quickly start on oral ser steroids. And if you're highly suspicious of infl inflammation, do not re-inject with whatever therapy you're using. Aggressively treat these p uh, patients. And if you can't use oral steroids, I doubt that that's true. But if you can't for some reason, you got to find a uveata specialist to help you through this to determine if IV steroids are, ne uh, are needed in this case. So in summary, inflammation is a known complication of all drug therapies. The exact nature and cause is not completely understood. We can easily miss subtle inflammation. we got to image these eyes longitudinally, carefully, examine eyes. We gotta share our data. We gotta make sure we understand this uh, amongst all of ourselves so we can come up with better therapies, manage acute inflammation with an aggressive approach, and be vigilant and persistent. Thanks for the time. <laughs> yes, gentlemen, go ahead. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, really interesting talk. Do you think that the surgical approach to uh, gene therapy plays a role in the degree of inflammation that one might expect? So, for instance, if you're doing a vitrectomy with a retinotomy versus intravitreal versus yeah. supracoroidal? I think there's so many aspects of it. I can't tell you that one is necessarily better than the other because I would make the argument that putting it in the subretinal space has probably some element of protecting it from the inflammatory response. Putting it in the intravitreal space has been shown to cause a significant amount of inflammation in a number of uh, gene therapy programs. At the same time, now, inflammation, though, is going to be dependent, or the type of inflammation, of where you put it. So subretinal uh, delivery may give you 
different inflammation than intravitreal, depending on what your target tissue is. And when you see overexpression or an inflammatory response, it could lead to damage of different types of tissue. So I don't think the inflammation is the same. I don't think the information is always sell or always haze. I think it's going to be different for each cause of this. That makes sense. Yes, sir. A quick question. So I know you like the New Zealand white rabbits, but if you were advising companies that were taking new pharmaceuticals to practice on which animal model, non-primate, that you would recommend preclinical work on, what would you recommend? I'd tell them to go, do ahead, go ahead and do a non-primate model because ultimately you need that. So if you're talking, are you talking about gene therapy or are you talking about like... Any, any AIP. Yeah, the problem is, Matt, I'll tell you more than anything, is that any of these, most of the, most of the treatments we have are humanized antibodies, if you look at really what we're doing, right? So humanized antibodies in any animal model, animal model is going to lead to inflammation, right? So we've seen this in a number of preclinical studies. So it's hard to, to determine that just from uh, an, uh, a rabbit model. Mm -hmm. So even a non-primate uh, model has its challenges, but most of the time some of these companies can actually develop a non-primate uh, 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 version of their drug, which can mimic essentially the inflammatory response. It's still not known. It's still not well understood. And from all this stuff, some of this requires a certain level of vigilance on the clinicians that are part of studies mm -hmm. to kind of pick up subtle stuff because we, we're, I think we're missing it at an early phase in some of these studies. There's a lot of pressure for all those who do studies here of trying to make sure that things are doing well and looking at things and what's real and what's not and sometimes it's very challenging to see. So, ahead, so you know, we saw this in some of the brolicizumab data, but what, what findings clinically were seen that uh, can, you can use as a marker for earlier detection of inflammation? I think, you know, the OCT is such a powerful tool. We were just talking about how great imaging is. At some level, looking at vitreous changes on OCT would be great. Looking at pre-retinal changes on the OCT is great. I think it's too late by the time that shows up. I think we, should, we need to move to an imaging model of capturing inflammation because clinicians are very poor at it. I love you all. We all suck at it. Right, so I think you know OCT assessment of the anterior chamber, OCC assessment of the posterior segment probably makes a lot of sense in some of these uh, drugs that are, I think, higher risk for it. Well, one of the things the SRC did see, which I think is important to look at in the previous OCTs versus the one, is, is to look for a vitreous cell. Yeah. So this is something that's real easy to see. Um, and if you see it in the previous one, maybe you want to think twice next time. We can see Nate, I'm sorry, Nate and then Yasha, sorry. Yeah, I should go first. Uh, no, I should go first. Sorry. I'll go. So I gave a talk last night in Orange County and to a pharmacy convention, and so we were talking a lot about um, you know anti-drug antibodies and neutralizing antibodies. The FDA requires in some of these studies you follow these. In the big clinical clinic, do you guys follow neutralizing antibodies or anti-drug antibodies, and what's the role? Are you talking about for patients who have... Um, you're getting exposed to a drug. So for exposure... No, I mean, the only... I'll say in the UVS clinic, the only time I get an anti drug antibody is for, um, you know, adalimumab looking at, because where there's data associated with efficacy and the presence of that. We have zero data on efficacy and anti-drug antibodies. I have theories on, I think it plays a role in some forms of this, but I don't have any proof. No. Well, that data has been presented. On ADAs and... Uh, for oh, for uh, I don't know if it's been... Uh, okay, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let, you... You know better than I do. No, it was. Okay. But the issue is that there's no tests that any of us can do, right? So the, the company would have to supply us with a test to be able to, to test for it um, to see what, te what type of risk the patient has. And so it's just prohibitive. The reason it's done in studies is because the FDA requires uh, that to be done. So, so we have the data from clinical studies, but doing it in clinical practice, we can't do. Uh, we should probably move on. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I, I guess, you know, one of the things is like the reading center uh, is a black box. Mm. And uh, to a lot of like <laughs> investigators, I know, I, and we've got a couple people here, so I'm going to take advantage of that. <laughs> uh, so d I guess this is a question actually for, for, for you, Dr. Novavami. Who, who reads at the reading center? What's their level of uh, training? Are they, are they retina specialists? Uh, no, they're not. They are people who have bachelor's degree in something, science mostly, and they are trained, certified at reading centers, quality controlled. They go through rigorous training process, continuous monitoring, and that's it. That's how it is, so yeah. Can I make a really quick um, as new biologics come on, I think it's more important than ever that we all uh, have hypervigilance about uh, IOIs and uh, imaging as much as possible. Even the biologics that you are used to now, all the uh, ranibizumabs, uh, bevacizumabs, and aflibrizumabs, and, you know, 
um, first map, even they are different lot to lot to lot. So even those, I think you need to have a, you know, hypervigilance. So uh, the young people out there just you know, do look at the eyes and uh, look for these inflammation. And second comment is that smart people like you, VIDA specialists like you, I'm just so amazed that you guys don't have a better way to <laughs> create these inflammation. So we, we do, it's just that the people who would be in charge of putting this out are imaging companies. And imaging companies don't believe that there is a market for this type of stuff. They, they don't hear that their customers, who are us, want any quantitative grading of imaging. It's not hard, Sumit published, I mean, even Sumit published it. But uh, my, my point is that, you know, that, my, that this stuff has been around for a long time, but it's, you know, go to any imaging company and say, hey, will you, pro, you know, give this, you know, will you try to sell it? Like, well, there's no market for it. Nobody wants it. And it's until things like this occur that it happens. I'll say to your point, Judy, biosimilars, concern me, and the concern is there's been a rigorous data, data set with all of our other drugs. I don't know if we'd have that, and it should it makes sense, but we've seen it with systemic biosimilars, adalimumab, infliximab, all the biosimilars with that, that there are patients who have poorer outcomes because they've been switched. And some of that is because of anti-drug antibodies that do occur in these patients. So something to be aware of. Yeah, I should take us home, man. <laughs> So the next speaker is Yasha Modi from NYU to talk about do you know this OCT finding? I actually changed the title a little bit. Oh, you changed the title. <laughs> it's yeah. worse. I like the previous one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be like a purely clinical talk. And uh, so we're not going to go over any graphs. There'll be no clinical trial data. Uh, but we are going to talk about some horses, some zebras, and even the polka dot zebra. Does anyone know the polka dot zebra? All right, well, we'll get into it. So these are my financial disclosures. Who here, uh, who's a fellow in this room? Can you guys raise your hands? I think we have <laughs> Anne, Andre, Jacob. I'm gonna bring you guys to the front of the room because I got permission to pick on you from Sunil. So oh, nice. come, come on up here, okay? Oh. And, and by the way, this is all fun and games. So and, anyone and in the audience. And if he's mean to you, I, I give him permission to buy you drinks later. <laughs> That's true. Drinks on me. So, you know, when we think about OCT, OCT has incredible value in retinal diagnosis. And when we can all look at these four images. Oh, yeah, take a seat. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we can all look at these OCT images, and immediately our brain knows the answer. Right, so if I asked any of the panelists, what's the top left diagnosis? So anyone want to yell? CRAO. CRAO, right? And then the top right is BRVO, the bottom left is PAM, and then the other one is an epiretinal membrane. And we have incredible pattern recognition that we get out of OCT. And so these are the horses of retina. And so, but there are also some zebras, and the OCT can be remarkably helpful at taking an otherwise difficult clinical situation and making it considerably easier. And of course, if you nail a zebra, you're certainly gonna make some of your faculty members <laughs> impressed. And if you nail the polka-dotted zebra, which was first discovered in Masamara not too long ago, back in 2021, you're certainly going to make others impressed. Who's <laughs> gonna, and welcome to Cole in the process. So let the games begin. We'll go over some horses. Here's an OCTA image. And thank you, Danny, for going over OCTA so beautifully. We have flow overlay on the cross-sectional image. Anyone want to guess in the audience what this diagnosis is? It's like Squid Games. <laughs> Are we allowed to answer? It? Yes, you, you can answer. Yeah, go ahead. It's a BRAO. It's a BRAO, exactly. And, you know, Dr. Kaiser says it with such certainty, and he's absolutely right. It's a BRAO. And one of the differentiating features is you can see there's atrophy. So you know this is chronic. There's no collaterals. So when you look at a BRVO as the alternative, you get venous to venous anastomosis. But if you just look at the OCT alone, frequently, if the exam is not very good and you can't identify that clinically, OCTA can tell you the differentiating features between a chronic BRAO and a chronic BRVO. So still a horse, case two, 57 years old, and he's got blurred vision in the right eye but I'm showing you the image of his left eye. Oh, come on, you can get this. <laughs> you know this. Mactel, that's exactly right. So you can see the cavitary loss <laughs> of tissue. Thank you, Danny, again for this one. And what you're seeing on the OCTA is you're especially the 
middle image is the superficial capillary plexus, and the image on the right is the deep capillary plexus, and this is the patient. So obviously the right eye is much more, much more obvious. Here's the OCTA images, and you can see the cavitary loss and layers of the laminations of the retina, much more obvious in the right eye than the left eye. But in the left eye, you have actually classical parafoveal grain where you would have probably got that clinically, but the OCT can also give you that diagnosis. And as we move through the different grades, OCTA can be remarkably helpful for identifying progressive disruption of the deep capillary plexus, which starts off temporally, and then eventually it goes circumferentially around the focus. So, case three. Again, an OCTA case. This is an OCTA cross-sectional image with flow overlay. The other eye has intermediate-sized drusen. So, this one's a little bit harder. I'm not showing you an ONFOS image here. This is non-exudative AMD with subretinal fluid. You see that there's no vascularization. And of course, this is a little unfair. I'm not really showing you the entirety of the cube. I'm not showing you on FOS imaging. But, but it's Yasha, really- by definition, subretinal fluid would be- Exudative, yeah. Say that again? By definition, if it has subretinal fluid, it would be- Exudative. So, oh, this is basically actually non, uh, neo, uh, okay, sorry, sorry, so non-neovascular AMD with subretinal fluid. And I guess there's a, a, a conversation now about what defines exudative versus non-exudative fluid that is basically going on between David Seraf and Bailey Freund right now. But you can also see this with basically subretinal fluid at the apex of the pigment epithelial detachment, where we think when you have these massive PEDs, you get ischemia, you get basically breakdown or dysfunction of the RP, and then overlying subretinal fluid. And this can also occur at the areas between pigment epithelial detachments. So these are two cases of non neovascular AMD with subretinal fluid. So we basically think about apex of the PED, between confluent drusen or at the base of the large pigment epithelial detachment. So if you see those cases, these are the ones clinically where maybe you don't want to go and say, I'm just going to start injecting them, but rather I'm going to get an OCTA. And these need to be verified by either OCTA or combined FAICG. The good news is if you can identify them, there's no need to treat with anti-VEGF. The bad is that these individuals typically have a higher rate of progression to geographic atrophy. We're moving on to some zebras. This is a 37-year-old referred to me by one of my retina colleagues, and the question is whether or not this was a sarcoid granuloma. What do we think? Anyone? So we're going to give an OCT talk, so I'm going to go and get an OCT through that. So does that help you? It's intrarenal. It's intrarenal, yeah. So what do you think? I think I heard somebody say it. It's not sarcoid. Yes, Sunil got it. This is a retinal astrocytic hamartoma. And what you can see is that these lesions calcify over time. So you start to see the shadowing deep to the retinal lesion. And so this is an astrocytic hamartoma. This person has no systemic manifestations of tubercular tuber sclerosis. And I also got an MRI of the brain to confirm this. So this is a retinal astrocytic hamartoma that was mimicking a choroidal granuloma. Another zebra. But we see this actually, this one we see much more frequently in clinic than you would otherwise think. This is a 68 year old, presents for second opinion after three anti VEGF injections. There's been no response. Nailed it. That's exactly right. So when we get an OCTA, we see a dilated vessel. And what we're identifying is that that large hyper reflective wall of that vessel. And this is parafoveal vascular anomalous complex, or PVAC, and this is the exudative form where we see some interretinal fluid. This can also exist in the non-exudative stage. So this is non-exuded PVAC where we see that hyperreflective wall, and this can change over time. So we can go and progress from the non-exudative stage to the exudative stage, and this is over the course of about three years, or just shy of that. And notice that these patients are frequently non-responsive to anti-VEGF therapy. And sometimes they can actually get so severe that they mimic this sort of Coates-like response. And some case studies have demonstrated that maybe lasering the wall can be potentially valuable, but the, con the, the, con the, you know, the flip side of that is that you're lasering very close to the foveal center. 72-year-old, floaters, both eyes. This is the OCT sign. 
And what we're looking at is specifically that hyper-reflective material where the arrow is in the retina. So, this is lymphoma. That's right. And this is vertical hyper-reflective lesions consistent with primary vitro-retinal lymphoma. I'm, I'm missing that every time. Oh my What's God. That? I would miss that every time. That's impressive. <laughs> and so the other thing you notice is that you have like total ellipsoid zone wipe out there. And the other thing is that when you look at all the patients who've had a diagnosis of primary vitro-retinal lymphoma, and then you start scanning through the OCTs, this is present much more frequently than we would otherwise think. This can be seen in over 50% of patients ultimately diagnosed with PBRL, and it's frequently outside of the macula. So if you're suspecting this clinically, do a bunch of OCTs outside of the macula and look specifically for these. Now, of course, when we think about primary vitreoretinal lymphoma, we're typically looking for things like this. We're looking for that subretinal hyperreflective material or hyperreflective material within the outer retina, or we're looking at these sub-RP changes, which are much more consistent and more classical for primary vitreoretinal lymphoma, but sometimes they can be a lot more subtle and they can look just like macular degeneration, loss of the ellipsoid zone, sub-RP elevations. So when you're seeing cells, and you're seeing this, you really want to kind of put these two together and really think about a diagnostic vitrectomy. And finally, for the last round, we <laughs> have the polka-dotted zebra. This is a 78-year-old woman with blurred vision for a year, and the vision is 2070. So the nice part about the polka-dotted zebra is it has its own signature. And this case also has its own signature, and this is what the signature looks like. So this is your OCT. Anyone want to guess off of this one besides Sunil? Because I think Sunil knows this. Is this a... Uh, was she on a MEK inhibitor? What's that? Was she on a MEK inhibitor? He's not on a MEK inhibitor, no. I'm going to go and show you a couple more images. This is the lens. And you start to see these sort of greasy deposits on the intraocular lens. And if you get an OCT through the lens, you start to see this material on the lens. Does this help anyone in the audience? Because this amyloid. is the signature of this disease. Amyloid. This is amyloidosis. This is iron filings in amyloidosis. And so this case was otherwise a pretty difficult case to make, but actually just by doing OCT imaging, we're able to come to a conclusion on what this is. And so ocular amyloidosis is really, really confusing. Variable presentations, very limited literature. It can have a systemic association versus, or it could localize, it could be acquired, there could be a hereditary cause to this, but there are a few unifying features. There's lens capsule deposits, there's pupillary border deposits, and then there are also vitreous opacities. And so this is a much more classical example of the iron filings that can be seen in ocular amyloidosis. Uh, and then also we see this sort of vitreous opacities that look very much distinct from cell. And the thought process is that this amyloid protein breaks through the retinal vascular wall and then deposits into the vitreous, almost as if you're like, sort of like looking at this juvenile X-linked retinoschisis, except a patient's 75 years old. So uh, that's basically the talk. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate you being great sports and th awesome work on the PVAC. I'm, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Good job. All right, so we are going to uh, go right to the panel, the surgical panel. And Sunil will will moderate. I'm actually gonna we're gonna do one case. I'm actually gonna have Anath come on up and do his case. Um, uh, and he's uh, been kind enough to give us a really cool case to talk about. Anath. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. Feel free to uh, ask Yasha as many questions as you want <laughs> about this case, just as revenge for my fellows. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Hey, hey you were the one who suggested it. This is true, but they don't know that. Thanks for narking on me. <laughs> so, I tried to condense, so I tried to condense this as much as I could while still keeping it intelligible. So this is a 28-year-old female who was referred to me 11 days after having her open globe uh, repaired in the left eye uh, by an outside ophthalmologist. The mechanism of injury is that uh, she uh, supposedly fell in the shower. 
Um, a CT scan was done which did not show any evidence of an intraocular foreign body. Uh, intraoperatively, a zone three scleral laceration was found for which the lateral rectus muscle had to be taken down. So when, uh, that was 11 days prior. When she presented to me after the repair, she was hand motions, uh, holding pressure. Uh, interestingly, she did have a little bit of a mild esotropia. Uh, again, the lateral rectus muscle had been taken down and put, uh, put back up. Uh, no RAPD. Did they cut uh, anything while they were there? I'm sorry? Did they cut anything while they were there? They cut any uvea or anything? Uvia or anything uh, like no, that? no, no, there was no uvial prolapse. Just closed it. That. Yeah, they just closed it. I'm impressed they took down the lateral rectus. That's amazing. I'm sorry? I said I'm impressed they took down the lateral rectus. That's oh, amazing. Yeah. That's great. Oh, yeah. Um, and so fortunately, there was not a whole lot of inflammation, but uh, there was a pretty dense hemorrhage on the posterior capsule of the crystalline lens, which was otherwise clear. And of course, there was no view uh, on the dilated fundus exam. So here's the B scan. Uh, it's kind of difficult to tell precisely what's going on uh, with the static image and without multiple images. Um, but I can tell you that um, there was a dense vitreous hemorrhage. There were clearly hemorrhagic choroidals that were starting to liquefy. And there was what appeared to me to be a retinal detachment. So she's going to need surgery. But how and when are you going to do this case? When was her trauma? I'm sorry, remind me again. Blunt trauma. How long ago? 11 days, so 11 days prior. Can you go back to the B-scan? And then the globe. So ba based on the B-scan, I would base it on if the, if the choroidals are liquefying, that's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I wait, that's my, that's my metric. It's the first time I'm meeting them. I usually make them come back one more time just so that they can, I can get them to look at them twice. So my magic number is somewhere between two and four weeks after the initial injury. So that, that's my practice, but uh, I'm sure other people will disagree, like Peter. Always disagree with him. <laughs> no, I mean, to, he's correct. If the choroidals, and these choroidals don't look horrible, uh, are, are liquefied, then you want to get the best chance of going in. The, the longer you go, the, the harder it's getting. So you're not gaining anything by waiting too long in a case where you know they, the patient, you know, to me, that's the retinal detachment in this case. I think the other, the other thing to consider is are you planning on putting a buckle on this patient because they already took a muscle down. It might be a little bit more challenging, and you don't want things to continue to scar. Completely agree with those comments, um, and that's pretty much precisely what, we, uh, what I ended up doing. So I took uh, her three days later, so it was exactly 14 days. Um, decided I wanted to, since it was done by an outside ophthalmologist, I wanted to see it for myself. And since it was a zone three, I was likely going to put a buckle on anyways. Now, because there was this esotropia and the lateral rectus muscle was taken down, I wanted to imbricate it before I hooked it in case it uh, slipped. I don't know how well it was re reattached. and I didn't want to lose sight of it and have it retract into the orbit. Ah. So because the, uh, choroid, uh, the choroidal was highest infrotemporally, I, I decided I was going to plan my choroidal drainage there. Of course, you're going to have to maintain the pressure while you're draining the choroidal. So probably going to have to put in a six millimeter cannula or potentially put in an AC infusion. And then on top of that, there's uh, hemorrhage uh, coating the posterior capsule. Are we potentially going to need to do a lensectomy? Then as mentioned, scleral buckle, because uh, you know, there's, it's a trauma case, zone three laceration filled with blood, young patient, it's a recipe for PVR. Of course, we're going to have to do a vitrectomy. Now it's a young patient, we're going to need to confirm that there's a PVD, although this frequently will occur by itself uh, after, you know, after trauma. And then if, if there's any peeling that needs to be done, we're gonna do that. Laser, of course, and then the question is gas versus oil. You got the whole list. Oh yeah. It's everything we do. Absolutely. Is there anything else we don't do? So let me ask you this guy, would you ever consider staging this? Like let's say you train the choroidal, you did the, put the buckle on, but your view was terrible for some reason. Would you, do you forge through and go in or do you, do you ever like try, consider like doing it in two steps? That's very strong foreshadowing for what's what's about. Oh, is it really? I did. That was that was. Uh, but uh, uh, fortunately, in this case, we did not have to. <laughs> okay, just, good. I just struggled through it. So uh, here, just trying to isolate the lateral rectus and then imbricating it again to gain control of it. Uh, fortunately, it hooked fine and it did not slip. So I put the uh, infusion in super nasally because we were able to see there. And then planning for uh, choroidal drainage here, going about seven millimeters uh, posterior to the limbus and using a 27 gauge needle and a cyclodialysis uh, spatula to try and get out any loculated blood. So once I do that to- It's so satisfying My satisfaction. That works. Yeah. Uh, mm. 
put in, uh, and I'm checking here with the light pipe to make sure I'm in. So then going in for o nasally, I put the inf tried to put the infusion there, but I can't see my light pipe coming in very well. Whereas by contrast, I can see it here. So take that out and more comes <laughs> oh. out. Oh, look, that's oh. fun. So Were you planning on keeping the lens? I was hoping to. <laughs> You're bold. I love it. <laughs> I was hoping to, but... Uh, uh, Alexandra, would you have taken the lens? Uh, I mean, I think there's such dense hemorrhage, probably. It's probably coating the back of the lens. That's, too. again, more foreshadowing. So here I'm fighting <laughs> through this bloody darkness, trying to mm -hmm. find where is where does the blood end and where does the retina end. I can see the end. nerve, though. I can start to see yeah. the detachment. Yeah. There's going, a nerve. I saw yeah. a nerve. Yeah. Yeah. Going That's slowly. a good view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It starts to it starts to go on. <laughs> Peter used the handheld lenses, so you can never yeah, see so, anyways. So I put a buckle good. on, but I can't see as well as I'd like to. So I actually do decide to go ahead and take the lens, which I was not thrilled about, but now I can see much better. So as, that, as Dean Elliott says, aphakia doesn't blind anyone. That's so. very true. How so, old is this patient again? 28. 28. Oh. So dissecting the hyloid, so there was indeed a PVD, but I wanted to, so there I can see a small break. So trying to get the hyloid all the way up to the buckle and remove as much of it as possible. I was able to drain through the break, lasered there and on the area of the detachment on the buckle. And then here, because there was no real PVR, I put in 14% C3 of eight gas. Nice. So the aftermath of this. Tell us something good. So on week oh. six, she uh, pinhole to 2060 was attached. Four months after that, uh, after the original operation, I took her back to the OR and I did a secondary scleral fixated IOL via the Yamani technique. And about three months after that, uh, oh, she was 2030. Sorry. IOL was well centered and retina was attached. <clears throat> this was her. That's great. This was her OCT. That's oh man, that's great. Is that is that a zebra, uh, Yasha, or is that a <laughs> golden? Are you sure you didn't miss amyloidosis? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't check. <laughs> But for the fellows, I mean, this was um, a case where, you know, as you see, we kind of put all the steps down. Uh, when you're planning for surgery, you want to plan for all potential contingencies, particularly in trauma, where you have a high probability of being surprised intraoperatively. But the more you're able to plan out and think about the entire surgery from the beginning to the end, uh, generally the smoother it'll go and uh, the less operative time that you'll have. Awesome. And, uh, great case. That's a great case. Nice job. Thank you. Nah, thanks. Ooh. Thanks for doing it. Well, Ooh. we're not going to get to that. Ooh, it was a, it was a mirror that. gel that we were going to show, but uh, we'll have to save it for next year, Peter. You'll get to talk to us about it. So we're going to end uh, at this point. You wanna